Hello everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ricardo Tavio and I'm representing EBM, a uh, Spanish consultancy firm. Um, thank you very much for attending uh, our uh, second session of the webinar today, uh, of online teaching webinar. Um, it's a great honor to, to, to have you here again uh, with us in case you, you were in the first session and uh, welcome if it's the first time that you follow us. And um, as you know, also most of the attendees to this webinar are uh, academics and, and, and teachers. Uh, and also that this webinar is based in the current needs of the education worldwide due to the pandemic. So uh, the first motivation, of course, is to provide tips and to share experiences uh, with the attendees and the lecturers. Uh, regarding the, the, the sudden transition from face-to-face -to, -face, uh, uh, to online education. Uh, today, we have a very interesting group of lecturers. Uh, the first of them would be my colleague at EBM, uh, Lauren Bardermir. Um, she will talk about soft skills for teachers uh, for online education. In second place, we will have Katerina Suru from web to learn Greece. She will let us know about crisis uh, affecting education and some examples of uh, COVID pandemic. In third place, we will uh, we will have Alexand Dr. Alessandro Caforio from the Università Telematica Internazionale di Roma from Italy on how to design your online didactic and at that moment, after Alessandro Caforio, we will make a, a small break. Uh, according to some of your requests on the first webinar. And uh, then we'll follow with uh, Dr. Daniel Varetin from the University of Cusano, Italy. And he will talk about the learning online uh, models. And finally, we will, uh, we will have uh, Professor Israel Garcia Alonso and Professor uh, Rodrigo Trujillo. Uh, these colleagues are from the University of La Laguna from the Department of uh, Didactics of Mathematics. They will talk us about continuous assessment in online teaching. Um, uh, after each lecture, they will have uh, a brief time for, uh, for, for questions and, and answers. So if you, if you follow us in the first session, you will know that you can make these questions via Facebook or via YouTube. Uh, and then the, the moderators will, send, will present the, the, the questions to, to the lecturers. Uh, so let me introduce you then to Mrs. Lauren van der Meer. The floor is yours and uh, very welcome to the second webinar. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here today. My name is Lauren Vandermeer, and I thought I'd start this by saying and daring to speak on behalf of my colleagues who have pitched in this webinar, that we're here today to share with you what we know and what we believe on in on a platform made with a lot of love and effort, firstly by Costa and Ricardo, and secondly by all the colleagues from whom from whom I've already learned so much and I'm looking forward to learning more from. So here are a few things I consider relevant about my professional or personal career. Um, although I studied and like doing other things, I'd say here are a few things I thought would be interesting to point out. So over 15 years of teaching experience, teacher trainer, design thinker, experience being a town educational coordinator and currently an educational consultant as well. So if I had to add anything else, I'd probably add that I love to dance, read and practice yoga. Why did I choose to share soft skills for online teaching? Well, because of this. I love memes, they make me smile when I can relate to them. So here's my go at making a meme. Our expectation after only one month of forced online teaching is to have all the tools, all the time, happy students, appropriate methodology, 
resources and web format, delivering things on time and having students turn things in on time. I don't know if you can see it on your screens, but those people are happy. <laughs> They're smiling. And yes, um, I can relate when I'm in yoga class in a terrible position, trying to breathe and not to faint. My yoga teacher usually says, come on, give me a smile. And yes, she has reason. If we smile, her brain usually relaxes and immediately releases endorphins. But I keep going back because I want to. This case is a little different. Most countries in the world have been under strict lockdown since mid-March. So I'd say first came confusion, then came instructions from everywhere asking us to do different things and start delivering online, and then came reality. So I don't wanna take up much of your time explaining reality because we all know what's happening and it's different everywhere we look. I chose this image because what most of us started doing was trying to put the same format, but in a different context. We're passing text or textbooks onto the computer. And you may ask yourself, okay, well, what's wrong here? It's not that wrong. I wanted to add a little drama to the presentation. So I wrote big red letters saying everything. <laughs> but it's not that bad. As my colleague said last Monday, many of us started off doing the same in an online environment, and that was okay at first, but we have to start looking for other options and tools. So let's not get pessimistic over this. How to deal with this is what my colleagues explained last week. We'll continue explaining today and this Thursday with different approaches, tools, and techniques. On the bright side, I have to say that regarding what concerns me, which is what this situation brings in the back of your mind as teachers, you probably already know the answers to all the questions you've asked. I'm just here to remind you. After asking around and receiving emails from teachers and professors from all over the world and doing some research, these are the main skills I'd like to name today. My intention with this is to give you all just some really basic reminders because I know you know this. So let's start off. Patient, remind yourself that it takes about two years to get a master's degree in online teaching. If you're new to this method, you have been trying for barely a month. Proximity. We've heard a lot about social distancing lately, but we can come together in other ways. Ask them questions, personal questions if you wish. Talk to them about what is on your mind. Tell them that we're specialists in certain topics, but maybe not in how to deliver this topic in diverse ways. Let them know we're also learning. Simplicity. We've heard a lot about social distancing lately, but we can move together and come together in different ways. Ask them questions, personal. Well, Albert Einstein, said, keep it simple, sweet, or if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand well enough. It's our job to put out the information out there and students' jobs to try to understand it. Deliver information, I would say, be open to receive questions when they don't know how to solve it. And as far as I've seen, some of us may be overthinking uh, deliverables. So take it easy on yourself. Acknowledgement. Acknowledge what they're doing, how their lives have changed, and be aware of how your own has changed and acknowledge how you yourself has changed, how everything has been moving around a lot lately. Take your time, accept it, and appreciate what you're doing. Not only yourself, but appreciate their efforts too. Take a minute to answer, how do we feel when somebody says thank you? when somebody says, great job, when somebody gives you a pat on the shoulder. Do we want to make others feel that way? We're just a message away. Next would be questioning. Question them, question yourselves, question colleagues. Normally people who question themselves often are those who can defend what they're doing and why they're doing it with a solid answer. Am I doing the best I can? Why do I teach this way? Is this the best way or the better way? Better for who? I'm not saying evaluate yourself. I'm saying ask yourself and be conscious of your answer. It may not be the best in others' eyes, but as long as you know why you're doing it, you have a reason to keep doing it the same way. 
or change. Communication. I think we all know this is the basic skill that we really need to work on, um, especially at this at these times. And I'd say it's the answer to most of the questions we've received. Communicate in as many ways as possible. Formal context, non-formal context. You don't have to create them if you don't want to, but you can leave the door open in case somebody wants to invite you to a coffee space per se, simulating when you go to the cafe and find students doing things and ask you the question, which so famously start with a, now that you're here, try coming to an agreement with students as when to deliver. Make a poll, clearly define what your expectations are. And if you have a doubt, ask them. There are as many solutions as people on this planet. Last but not least, I'd say time management. Not everybody has the same timing. Some, as we know, are owls and others are early birds. Now that the scenario has changed, both teachers and students can adapt to when their body works best. Take advantage of it. If it's what you want, you will develop this new time management over time and decide upon what type of learning options would you like to you would like to deliver. I'd say, although these I've been through really quickly, this is something that we should remember. In many cases, teachers and professors have academic freedom. This is the freedom of teachers and students to teach, study, and pursue knowledge and research without unreasonable interference or restriction from law, institutional regulations, or public pressure. I gathered a few elements I found about academic freedom that you may want to hold on to. So here are the four. Freedom of teachers to inquire into any subject that evokes their intellectual concern, to present their findings to their students, colleagues, and others, publish their data and conclusions without control or censorship, and to teach in the manner they consider professionally appropriate. This last one is where, as far as I'm concerned, we should stop. I'm gonna go through a few questions that came up while enrolling to the webinar. So what made us come to this conclusion that we needed as a soft skill part? What's going on through our teachers' heads? And these are just a few of your questions. How to support students to keep working isolated from their natural ecosystem, the classroom? Well, I'd say again, this question has as many answers as students there are, and who says their natural ecosystem is the classroom? Can it change? I would say communication would be here again, the main skill that we want to work on. Teaching online motivation for, for, for professors and students, how stressful it is. <laughs> Going back to the skills, I'd say time management, putting time into planning and to finding what is best for each teacher and his or her ways of teaching will take its time at first trying out but surely it will have a much better impact on your future ways. Now's the time to try out, to look for new ways and explain to students that you're looking for your way and they are going to be the lucky generation to accompany you. How to support students' involvement in active distance learning. Communication again. First of all, I'd ask myself, what is active? And what do I expect when I ask how to support students' involvement in active distance learning. Then I wonder if I have asked them what my expectations are. One thing is not understanding, not having the same mind map and therefore not meeting expectations. And another is having explained the mind map and come to similar understandings and then not doing it. How to help students stay optimistic and motivated during lockdown. So again, I'd say proximity here. All realities are different. Are you thinking about a specific person? Are you thinking about a whole group? What about a call so everybody can share experiences? I know most of you have been doing this. Why not prepare a silly kahoot, for example, about lockdown, what they've been doing? Get the spirits up and have a moment to let them know the door is open for a chat, an online coffee, 
whatever you can think of or they can think of. How to keep people interested along three hour classes. So how would you keep them interested in a physical class? Why not make two breaks? The first thing that came to mind when I read this question was, why not ask students to prepare the break times? So for long sessions, two or three students can prepare the 10 minute breaks. I thought maybe some could come up with an exercise everybody can do, another one can play music and become a DJ for 10 minutes. Let them get creative trying to set their co colleagues mood and again, letting them have that moment of interchange. How to provide emotional support for myself while online teaching as well as major roads to offer emotional support to students during online learning. For this question, I find myself reading the skills again and again, giving special attention to communication. Why? If there's time to worry about this and ask ourselves these questions, there's time to communicate with students about this. Try to focus on it like a team, not like you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. We get a lot of those questions. As an educator, here's another question. As an educator, how can I help students that are facing emotional or psychological difficulties during this time? Communication, leave the door open, I would say, again. Positive and negative effects of e-learning. I wanted to bring this one up especially because I don't think there are effects. I don't think the way of seeing online learning is as if it had its effects. I think we could change that word to make it not sound like a medicine we're taking. Maybe change it into pros and cons. I don't think online learning has its effects. I think maybe lockdown has its effects, but that's changing and we'll continue doing so little by little. What concerns us, I'd say, is pros and cons of online learning. And surely you're going to find loads of pros. How can I create a close relationship with students to improve their confidence and self-esteem in the importance of their practice of caring in the life of others. So again, communication and proximity. As you've seen, most of the time, communication comes up in all of them. We're far apart, but that doesn't mean we can't see our faces with a video call or spare 10 minutes for a phone call. Let students know we have tutorial hours and that they can be used by communicating previously not necessarily for strictly academic reasons, if you wish. How can we encourage and pre-structure self-directed learning, time management? And here I would say this is, again, uh, not on our shoulders. Um, we can teach as much as we'd like, but they also have to do their self-directed learning plan. Yes, we can help them with time management, giving them time structuring tools, but ultimately they have to dedicate some time to organizing new ways of studying. Campus life in an era of social distancing was also something that came up. And what first came to mind was, what about campus life do we want them to live? What part of it? I strongly suggest that we question everything we ask ourselves because most of the time, I find that we're overthinking or expecting ways for students to have campus life or social life do we want them to have campus life or do they want to? If they, to, if they do, then what tools and ways can they come up with in order to create it? I would say we could shift, or this is a good time to shift from answering questions to framing questions. A really good friend of mine is doing a master's degree and her teachers are not called teachers or professors. They're called learning facilitators and say that their function is to frame questions. So why not? We have tools many tools in fact, develop theories, ways of use, YouTube tutorials, this fantastic webinar with participants from all over the world. Yet yeah, now you must choose which one adapts to you and your way of teaching. The key to success is often the ability to adapt, said Confucius just a few years ago. Of course, he had no idea COVID-19 was coming because surely he wouldn't have said that. While preparing this, the annual lumberjack competition tell kept came in kept coming to mind. So if you get a chance, I'd recommend everybody that has a few minutes at the end of the day, take notes of the name and give yourself a few minutes to Google it and read it. It may take five minutes total. To finish, I'm summarizing with a few questions that may help you with further questions you may ask yourselves. 
Are you taking care of yourself? How much do you want to improve? What are you willing to do to improve? And is it important or is it urgent? And just a quick note on this last one. There's a big difference between important and urgent, and it's where the need comes from. Important comes from within and urgent comes from outside. We need to learn to, of course, do the so-called urgent, but more importantly, not to forget to pay attention to what's important. Thank you very much. If you have any questions and I have an answer, I'll be more, to ha more than happy to give you my opinion. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to have you today here with us. Um, for all the attendees, uh, we, we have started now uh, uh, a questions and answers uh, section. So please feel free uh, to, to start uh, sending uh, interesting questions to our first lecturer. She'll be very glad to, to, to reply you. So let's see, I think before, uh, while we wait for some questions, some of our, our, our attendees were uh, saying that also, for example, Rosario said that she believed that trust is also a very important skill. Definitely, I would say trust is definitely an important skill. Um, but I would also put that into communication. Um, without communication, it's very hard to, I'd say, strengthen that trust. So, yes, trust is very important, but I would definitely back it up with with good communication. And you see any uh, difference on now on online education in this way to create this this trust? Because when you uh, when you, in the offline world, trust is normally. Uh, dependent on the time you spend together, and, but online it's uh, it's uh, pretty a little bit different. Huh? I would say regarding this proximity is probably what you could offer. Um, all these Zooms meetings or tutorial times that uh, professors have are a great chance to do something silly or not, or to open the space to have everybody be able to ask a question or a conversation. It's amazing how much a simple 10 minute conversation can do just to get to know somebody and feel that somebody's there for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people also, it's, uh, for example, if the student not interested in these challenges and change, how we can help them to participate? Okay, um, I would, always go back i'm i'm very pro as you can see uh to communication so i would go back and ask what are you why are you not interested what is wrong why do you not want to participate or how can i help you participate and sometimes it may be difficult but that's why i ask the final questions how much are you willing to do in order for them to participate if you're thinking about one person or one group, why not give it a chance and give yourself a session with an hour or with all your students just pitching in questions or pitching in opportunities of changes and improvement. Okay, our colleague from, from Canary Islands as well, Monse Gallardo Manceo says, as that she said that she loves your clear difference between urgent and important. And uh, how do you think it changed the, the, this urgent and important considering the new channels? Um, I think it's very easy to fall into a lot of urgent things. Um, now that we're connected constantly and we have our computer set and our emails connected to our phones, and everything is so connected and we're so online that we constantly get inputs and it's hard. I understand it's hard to difference between urgent and important, but it's possible. And I think of course with time management and having very clear what your objective is for the day or what your objective is for, for the morning or for your session, I think that can really help 
to difference what urgent and what important is and also know what's important for you as a teacher, what's important for your students. Mm -hmm. There are several questions around this issue of urgent and, and, and importance, so people is really uh, aware of the of it. So uh, another interesting question, it's uh, and it's also recurrent because some people asking about the the equipment. Uh, any ideas for us who are dealing with students who don't have a dedicated screen for them at home? on top of flow bandwidth internet connections. Since we have a lot of uh, connections from all over the world, with not uh, broadband maybe, uh, any any special suggestions? I'm also looking into um, what options we can use because of course we also work with um, students and schools from around the world and we know that connection isn't always as good. Um, I would say, of course, that's one of the cons of online education, not being able to get to everybody. But most of the time, there are many apps that are downloadable for phones. And although they don't have a dedicated screen at home, most of the times we could either record the session or we could download the app for a phone. So I don't know what age we're talking about here in this particular question. But I'd say that um, older students, well, especially university students, secondary school students would definitely have either a cell phone or some sort of app. Mm -hmm. So okay. regarding your place, I would choose something that could um, adapt to that, either recording or, or an app that can be downloaded onto phones. Okay, uh, several people were concerned about, about this issue mm -hmm. and uh, also they are asking, they are saying that it is difficult to evaluate the amount of time and effort that students have to devote to this type of learning, how we deal with this? Uh, yes, it's difficult to evaluate the amount of time and effort, but um, I also wonder why or what is the reason behind evaluating the amount of time and effort? Because if what we want them to do is achieve a certain task or a certain um, job to get done, then how important is it to know how much time they put into it? And yes, if it, it then of course, I think communication would come back in the playing field because if it's too much that we're asking for, then they will probably communicate it or we can ask, okay, what are the options or why did this not come in time or, but I would okay. definitely say communication would be key to this. A key element. Okay, yeah. so, uh, so people is highlighting as well the importance of emotions in relation to learning and education. And for example, we have another approach here. It is really important to create bonds and relationships in online education environments. So uh, I will ask, uh, this is for sure easier for those teachers who already have had a contact previous to this crisis, for example. But uh, since we don't know how much will last education this way, these bonds will be We'll, we'll have to, to make these bonds in another way. Uh, so uh, what do you think about this? What will be the future of, the, of this uh, emotion uh, education? Um, I would say that not necessarily we won't be creating these emotional bonds online. I think we do have the option, especially when we can see our, each other's faces and have a direct and clear communication. Um, and as I said before, the first thing that came to mind when we spoke about really long sessions, which could be something completely taken into other fields, would be why not giving them the option of um, facilitating them? Why not giving them the option of teaching us something? Five first minutes, every break. If we're going to have a two-hour class, why not give them 10 minutes to break up the room and change it up a little bit. And they can also show their skills, their emotions, what they're interested in, what they're not. And this can also create bonds. So I think we are on time. The, thank you very much, Lauren, for, 
for being with us, for your very interesting Thank presentation. You. And now I will leave you uh, with uh, one of the my co-organizers of this webinar, uh, Dr. Costas Petridis, and he will uh, present you the, ne ne the next lecturer. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank, Thank you. you, Lauren. Thank you, Ricardo. Welcome from my side. I'm Costadinos Petridis from Hellenic Mediterranean University. Thank you, all the attendees that we, uh, we are with us, you know, for this uh, second round of the webinars on online teaching. Uh, now I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Katerina Zuru, uh, one of our uh, speakers and one of our uh, partners in a lot of projects. She's, uh, she has a PhD in linguistics and she's, her talk is about the impact of the pandemic to the higher education. So Katerina, the floor is yours. Uh, you have around 20 minutes and then we will leave around 10 minutes for questions. Thank you very much uh, for your effort and to be with us. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Ricardo, for being the moderator. Uh, thank you very much, Costas, for organizing all this great effort. I realized with just, for, with just a short talk today, I realized how much energy you have put in this and uh, we are all um, grateful uh, for your uh, uh, time and commitment. Let me please share my screen. I have some slides uh, for you. Is that okay? Can you hear us? Costas, can you please confirm that uh, sound is okay? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So, um, so let me start. Uh, I'm Katerina. I'm a researcher in open social and digital learning, and I'm a big fan of open access, open science, and citizen science, and understood as uh, the engagement of citizens in uh, in in open science. Um, this is a short outline of my talk. I uh, will start by a snapshot of the global impact of on education and just say a snapshot because uh, there is uh, already a big uh, and wealthy uh, body of literature about um, the, how the pandemic affects education. Then I will move slightly on the um, impact on ordinary teaching activities of the pandemic then I will deal with initiatives taken by educators in response to this new reality. And I will finish my talk with, on a positive side <laughs> of seeing the pandemic as a learning opportunity. And I will take the example of the uh, EU against the virus hackathon that ended uh, a couple of days ago. So, um, Education is heavily dis di di disrupted. Uh, bottom right, you can see uh, yesterday's data from UNESCO Institute for Statistics. Um, you can see that almost 1.3 billion learners are affected. And Katerina, almost, I'm sorry yes? for the interruption. You should place your uh, presentation, your transparency in the full screen. Ah, yes, I'm sorry. Is it, uh, is it okay now? This is uh, full screen, Costas, now. Can you see? Is it better? Costas, is that okay? I mean, it's not full screen. You should go full screen to the PowerPoint. You should press full screen to the PowerPoint. Yes, this is what I do. I just wonder if it's just uh, an issue with uh, the screen, the stream yard. Okay, uh, indeed, I, I go back to, to the slides and this is, ah, uh, yes, I can perhaps increase from here. Okay, is, is this, this is the best I can do. Is that okay? Getting a lot of uh, comments from the attendees. You can press F5. They told me that if you press F5, then it's it will go to the full screen. Uh, 
I five. I mean, if you go with slide so for example, up there and you press full screen. No. Can you advise also for a Mac user? No. I mean, in the Mac user also, I'm using Mac. I mean, you can go to the PowerPoint down to the right, right uh, down to the right corner, and there's a there's a bottom for a full screen, a slideshow icon. Do you want me? Okay. Do you want me to no, share? Think... To share your no. presentation, and the, when you will tell me, I will change the transparencies. I can play them full screen. Okay, that's fine with me. Thank you very much. So, so stop sharing your presentation, and I will do it from my computer. All right. I know it's funny because anyway. Uh, yes. So, I let me stop. This. I'm sorry. Now you can talk. I mean, you can see my screen, no? Thank you very much. So we are uh, on slide uh, three. Costas, please. Here? Yes, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So. Yes, this is the current situation uh, stipulated by UNESCO uh, yesterday, showing the the impact of, of the disease and especially the impact on, on education. Next slide, please. On the EU uh, level, this is also uh, on this page. I will be very happy to share all, all the links with you. Uh, in this page, uh, there are data aggregated on how uh, the pandemic affects education in in the EU. Next slide, please. If one can synthesize uh, in just four points uh, the impact of the pandemic, uh, then perhaps we can borrow uh, UNESCO's uh, slide, this from the chair in uh, community-based research and social responsibility in higher education. They indicate that first, the pandemic has highlighted the significance of local actors and institutions. And in my next slides, I will connect how uh, how the lo local actors and institutions can play a role in in education. Then uh, the fact that uh, there's there, there's a need to mobilize different kinds of knowledge to address the problem. Third parameter is that. Local innovations and solutions are are required, and also this affects education. I will deal with that in a couple of moments. And one cannot back, go back to normal. So there's a need to find new ways of teaching and living after the pandemic. Based on these four points, let me expand further on education. So, Costa, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, right. First, there is a big impact on ordinary teaching activities because teaching and learning routines are severely disrupted. This means that there's lots of efforts on the national and international levels to mitigate the immediate impact of school closures. Okay. So governments are now setting up uh, virtual classrooms, collaboration platforms, etc., at an incredible speed. But uh, this has uh, an impact on individual teachers' routines, which means that there is a big confusion or even doubt about uh, questions as like which learning platforms to use, how to aid teachers in implementing online learning, how to reach those with a little or no internet, uh, internet access at home, which is um, some um, against uh, among the, the many questions that disrupt daily routines of teachers and learners. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Costas. Going to, to address these questions and also to connect with the questions that ha they have been uh, posed in this uh, in this webinar, I have found this uh, this page, which is among among others that I will share with you. 
which deals with how the COVID-19 crisis taught us about on online teaching. And there I found very good advice and answers on questions such as whether the advantages of fully asynchronous or synchronous learning, uh, how to engage your students uh, during online teaching, uh, how to keep up motivation, uh, how you can set the stage for successful interaction. So I will, I will share the link. Uh, I think it is one of the most insightful pages with, with guidelines and tips on how educators can deal with the, 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 the range of situations and problems uh, uh, we, we all face. Next slide, please. Uh, let us now move the discussion about the new roles, the new roles and skills for education, uh, for educators. Uh, I have indicated, for instance, agility uh, and resilience, the ability to cope with unknown technologies within a short time frame. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is that agility is not natural for everyone. You cannot expect uh, anyone to be agile, to be fast, to adopt uh, tools and to understand the functionalities and also to share them with, with the learning community. Also, there's a big issue with digi digital literacy skills. If someone does not have the competencies, uh, the digital skills, one cannot, you cannot just because you put this person the tools available that you expect this person to use these tools naturally in, in a, in a, in a, um, in a natural way. So, <clears throat> uh, although agility is somehow required, it is not natural. So, and this creates tensions, of course. Uh, the ability to cope with uh, learners, the ability to act as teachers, also to new target groups. But uh, I would like to dedicate the following slides in seeing the pandemic as a learning opportunity for educators. So, up to now, I have developed and expanded on, on the situation and the problem, how this affects and the tensions. Now let me show a bit, uh, some examples of, uh, of how the pandemic can be a learning opportunity. So next uh, slide, please. Uh, right, so first educators can engage in social action uh, by, uh, by means such as donations. There is a big donation uh, organized by the World Health Organization. Uh, currently, it's happening right now. There's a EU global challenge uh, live streamed, and there is lots of efforts to collect money for that. And also, someone can also participate in crowdfunding. Uh, I give you just an example of uh, the world's largest open source library of coronavirus uh, tools and data. But here we talk about how educators can help into social action with their skills and their expertise, with their background of, of pedagogy and, and, and education. So next slide, please. Uh, Costas, uh, one, one of the initiatives I would like to share with you is this uh, portal of, uh, it's called UNESCO Learning Cities to Response to COVID-19. And there are examples. This is just a snapshot. There's examples of cities, uh, basically of educators, who find, how can I say, creative or engaging um, ways to, to ensure that learning does not stop during the pandemic. Uh, some, some of them are really uh, worth watching because they, they show how far the creativity of an educator can go. Uh, and it gives a global perspective into what we are talking now. Uh, next slide, please, Costas. And uh, the other example I would like to share with you uh, is uh, the EU Against Virus Hackathon. It took place uh, last week uh, remotely. Uh, I don't know if you, if you have heard or even if you have participated. I would love to read on the chat if you had or if you have heard about its existence. Um, Costas, uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, it has been a, it has been a very uh, impactful event. During uh, during three days, 
uh, 21,000 uh, participants, mostly from Europe, but not only from Europe, uh, got, got each other to solve uh, challenges, which means basically problems in all, in all fields. Uh, and uh, it has been very massive because there was, there was many nationalities, countries, languages, also business partners uh, giving awards. Uh, because the best um, the best solutions have been given uh, money awards and also opportunities for incubation and follow up of their ideas. Overall, there have been two 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 thousand solutions that have been um, um, promoted as as a good examples of how we can fight against coronavirus. Now you you may ask why. I talk to you about a hackathon because a hackathon is by definition some, something that uh, um, uh, that uh, is, is, is of interest for people from the IT sector, development of applications, platforms, marketing, also sustainability. Uh, do you know? Do you know why I, I talk about a hackathon in a education context uh, like, like ours? I see some people who know about that, others not. Let me tell you. Uh, next slide, please, Costas. Okay, because one of the one of the categories or one of the topics uh, of of the of the hackathon was about education. So basically, uh, the European Union said we have we face challenges in health in, in uh, business continuity in, in finance but also in education so there was an there was a request to find solutions in the education and remote working area that that's why i i point you i point this uh, initiative out next uh, slide please costas so within this eu against virus hackathon there was a several subcategories of the category remote working and education uh, that, uh, that dealt with e-learning methods and tools, remote working primary, secondary, university challenges, and also student challenges, family work and life. And from these two, 2000 um, ideas, there has been awarded several ones, of course, in the area of um, in the area of remote working and education. So I really recommend you that, that you have a look at the results because the awards have been given. And uh, these are the most promising, promising ideas in the, uh, in the area of education and digital education in the future uh, for Europe. They, they, they are incubated now and they will be um, promoted largely uh, in Europe if, if, if they are sustainable enough. So my next slide uh, is, is the last one. Um, I, I, so two, two slides more. Uh, I would like to share my experience as a mentor of, of this hackathon. So what brought me to share this experience of the hackathon is that for you who are educators, I think there is an opportunity to get involved in collective action for a social purpose against uh, in the fight uh, against coronavirus, okay, with your expertise in how educational solutions can be shaped. All right, because for instance, in this hackathon, one of the categories has been uh, has been education. On, only educators can can work with IT developers to uh, to offer solutions. And the other one, one of the advantage that only educators have is their skills and expertise in tutoring and coaching. So the pedagogical di dimension of, of your job as a, as a method methodology expert. So I found these very two big uh, assets of, of your uh, profile. And I would like to conclude, uh, so this is my last slide now, uh, Costas, that, um, there's an opportunity that I see for educators to push for bigger representation of education, education related issues in policy debates about coronavirus. When we talk about coronavirus, we mostly think of health, uh, business continuity, 
uh, digital finance. Of course, these are fundamental, but also we, sh we shouldn't forget education and uh, to find uh, solutions to educational problems, we need also a global approach. Uh, the, the, the reality is that there is a um, low number of hackathons, including education-related challenges, as I showed you. The most are about digital development and IT. Uh, but I think that, that what I would like to, to is it's a message I would like to share is that education is a must and should be dealt uh, globally, uh, despite the fact that health issues are most important in the coronavirus uh, policy debate. That was all on my side, thank you. So, let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, so thank you very much, Katerina, uh, for your presentation. Um, and let's check if uh, there are some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, since the question they will come, I have a question. Ah, okay, there is a question. Thank you very much, Natalia. How do you think will this pandemic result in some kind of natural selection among teaching staff? Will someone, uh, I cannot understand, you know, the other word, be fired? Sorry, uh, let me... You, you can see the, the question on your screen? <clears throat> yes, so... Uh, I wanted to share, I just, uh, Costas, I just put on the chat the slides so that people can use the links that mm -hmm. uh, are embedded on the slides. So now uh, I can... Anyhow, all, all the presentations, they are going to be available uh, to the audience after the 7th of May. Uh, so, and also the, the session, the second session is uh, recorded. So as the first one is now available through our website, the second session also will be available. Thank you very much. If I thank you, Costas. If I understand well, the question is about um, if there will, if if I think that there will be any pioneers or the people who will make it and those who will not make it among uh, among the teaching staff. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, the, I'm positive. I think that educators is are, are catalyst. In, in development and societal change, uh, I, I cannot think of uh, lack of the, the, the educational uh, activity in general. I, I don't believe, I don't uh, think it will happen. So oh, I have a, one question for you, Katerina. I mean, through your uh, collaboration and through your contacts and interaction through this um, event that the European Union um, organized, uh, what do you think? Are we going to return back to the old uh, days of Erasmus? So we will be able to travel around and visit other uh, other institutions and students. They travel to our institution and our students, they can travel, you know, to our institution. If yes, where? I mean, what do you think? If no, when do you think that we are going to return? If we are going to return to back nice uh, days of the Erasmus, like we have interaction, we travel around and we interact with the people. Do you think that Erasmus will return back to the old days? Uh, definitely, we will miss a lot the spontaneity of the old times in Erasmus, you know, this strolling around and, uh, you know, uh, not, not, not attending classes, but enjoying, you know, the cultural side of, uh, of, the, of the experience of being abroad. I don't know, may, many people say that we will not never go, get back to, to ha how we have lived. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is going to be a nice webinar to organize, to organize, to <laughs> invite all the national agencies and discuss with them, you know, their opinions since they are closer to Brussels to explain to us what are the future plans. Uh, by, but we have another one question from uh, our colleague Da Silva. Thank you very much for the presentation, reaching information to Constant at the end. I would like to know if it is possible to share some of the points discussed in Hecadon related to education. I think that you must. It's it's a must. <laughs> Please do uh, the, the link uh, with the, the results of the of the hackathon in the education sector is something that is really promising. 
and that's also the, the, the reason why I, I share this information with you. Uh, the teams are multilingual and multicultural. This is also a very good point. Uh, to go back to your question, uh, Costas, about, you know, will we, will, will we be able to go back uh, to some exchanges and interaction? Now there are, there are many facilities to, to do very creative things with people that we never met online for a social purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katerina. And go back to another question to Natalia uh, Binder. Uh, all the information regarding this uh, event uh, that uh, Katerina has presented and participated uh, can be shared through the links that Katerina has uh, shared with us. Uh, so I think that uh, this is uh, for Katerina's time within our webinar. Thank you very much, Katerina, for your contribution. Um, and uh, we should move uh, to the next speaker. So, Ricardo, uh, let us introduce Alessandro Caforio. Uh, Ricardo will present more things. It's very interesting because he's the first uh, academic that we have within our webinar that he works as an academic within an online university. So I think that we're going to have a lot of technical questions from my side, at least, as an academic that I don't know anything and I have a lot of questions on my mind and also from the audience. So enjoy. Yes, our next lecturer would be Dr. Alexandro Caforio from the Universitat Telematica Internazionale uh, and his lecture is around how to design your, your online didactic. The floor is yours, Alessandro. Thank you, Ricardo, and thank you, Costas. First of all, I would like to thank you for organizing and managing this webinar. I'm trying to share my screen, first of all. And I think that we are now. So the title of the presentation is pretty challenging and ambitious. And of course, I, I'm not going to explain how to design an online didactic in 15 or 20 minutes, but just to provide you an idea of what is Uni Nettuno, my university didactic model, and how you can use some tip for orchestrating your remote didactic differently. Very few words about me. I'm the head of research and innovation in my university. I work within Unionettuno since 20 years. Also, if Unionettuno was launched in 2005, because Unionettuno is born from the experience of a previous existing consortium called uh, Nettuno Consortium. That was a consortium who made by traditional universities in Italy and providing to those universities um, distance learning services, starting with satellite television, video cassette, VHS distribution, and a blended learning model, and then moving to the full online model when the technologies allowed us to do that. So we started working on distance learning and online learning a long time ago, and nowadays our model is based pretty much on the research of my professor, director of uh, Uni Nettuno, Professor Maria Matagarito, and her research team that, I, that now I am leading. And therefore, we are not using an open source platform or like Moodle or Canvas or a uh, commercial platform like Blackboard, but we decided, she decided to use her pedagogical knowledge to build something tailored on the, the pedagogical needs they want, uh, she wants to address. So Unionetuno platform is something very specific that we developed and we keep uh, evolving using both research results and technological implementation. Uh, currently, we are serving more than 25,000 students coming from 167 different countries because we offer program not just in Italian, but also in English, French, Arabic, and also Greek, Spanish, and something very little also in Chinese and Russian. Um, what I'm going to try is to introduce you to Uninetuno model, and using that model in order to give you some hint about how to reorganize your didactic. Um, since we started from television uh, 30 years ago, in 1991, 1992, uh, 
our core component in the online didactic, at least for this, what, what we call self-paced learning or individual study, is our video lessons. Video lessons are on-demand content. Usually we hire top professors from other universities or experts uh, in specific fields to record the video lesson that we use as a didactic content. As in a traditional university, you can use a handbook or a textbook written not just by you as a professor, but by someone else. Uh, our video lessons are specific for some aspects. First of all, we like to structure the video lesson in subtopics. And these subtopics are the links that are on the left side of the screen. So a student can also decide both to watch the video lesson from the beginning to the end, or to jump in a very specific moment of the video lesson when the professor is talking about a specific topic. And then on the right, you can see we provide a list of categories of didactic materials. That list of categories is available also at course level. So if I'm looking at the Mathematic 1 course, I can have all the list of books and articles available, or multimedia, or references to bibliography or to online references, so cytography. But if I click while I'm watching the lesson, so lesson number one to books and articles, the system will provide me just a subset of the specific kind of contents related to the lesson I'm watching right now. Then we developed a second level of granularity in this content provision, what we call bookmark. At specific moment of the lesson, this red box highlight a very specific category of didactic contents. And if a student clicks on it while it is highlighted, the system is not showing uh, a list of contents, but, but it will open up a specific pop-up with the specific content related to what the professor was saying in that specific point of the video lesson. Of course, this is not easily replicable. Uh, you need the studio, you need some technician to do bookmarks and whatever. Um, at, uh, from the pedagogic and from the student time management level, this kind of contents that should not be, if you are going to start right now, professional video lessons, are good for flexibility and for control because they are on demand and the student can watch or just download the PDF or a lesson outline or download the PowerPoint because all of these content are part of this cluster of contents. So contents that you provide to students and that they can access whenever they want, on-demand contents. They are flexible. They, uh, they are not asking students to be in a specific place at a specific time. So no space or time limitation. They can access to contents using their phone, using their laptop in the night or in the day. Students have control on them because if you design them hypertextually, students can watch them or study on them in a linear way, but they can use them also hypertextually. So creating association and links among contents in the same unit. Of course, they uh, have a low level of interactivity because it's the professor speaking or is the text written that is providing information to the student, there's not so much interaction in it. How you can provide this kind of learning cluster to students? So how to organize your content? Of course, you can create groups of contents, organizing them in units. So giving students not just a bunch of uh, materials to be downloaded, but organizing them in subset with a, with a name, with a topic name. So they will have unit number one with a set of slides, probably uh, a PowerPoint presentation, a reference to a book they already have, etc. The other thing is build your own resources. You don't need to have a professional camera, but you can start using a PowerPoint, capturing the screen and while talking on the, on the slides. And that will be your first video lesson. You can improve it, OK, but you have to consider that in this case, you are creating something that you can reuse. And in the next year, if, you, if we are going to be forced to do everyone online learning, you will have a first set of resources made by yourself that you can start to reuse, to improve, to refine,
creating your own library, your own content repository, useful also for the next classes. Provide deepening material, so don't limit yourself to providing just one content, because students probably will want to go deep on some specific topic to if they are going to ask you for their final dissertation probably having a list of uh, relevant bibliography will help them also deciding what to ask to you for the final dissertation and finally use oers oers are open educational resources usually traditional professors are a little bit mm, shy in trying to go online and to understand which kind of contents are already available and open and what they can reuse made by someone else in their in their courses. And while now this is something you have to force yourself to do. Uh, for example, you can find a lot of MOOCs. Unitetuno itself is providing more than 240 courses, which is 5,000 of video lessons in several languages available for everyone. But if you just Google OER, so the first result probably will be MIT Open Courseware, in which we, you will find a lot of video lessons recorded and organized with also PowerPoints available and a lot of materials for a lot of topics and contents and courses that are made by MIT professors. If you look for Open Up Ed, is the European initiative on MOOCs that uh, act as a sort of umbrella supported by European Commission in which a lot of online universities, Unitetuno for Italy, UNED, then uh, UOC for Spain, and Open UK, Open University of Netherlands, etc., provided their MOOCs. And that can be a good base, a good starting point for understanding if you can reuse something already existing without reinventing the wheel. The second aspect on providing online learning for the Unitetuno model is let students try what they learn. Uh, in our learning environment, we have three kinds of these uh, activities that we propose to students. Assignments, what we call exercises, so something that the professor provides through the platform and the student have to submit in order to be corrected and graded by the professor and the tutors. Then we have interactive exercises that usually are automatically graded by the system, providing automatic feedback and immediate feedback to students. Usually we do not use this for evaluating students. We use this for providing students uh, an immediate feedback on what they are studying. And finally, we have the virtual laboratory. In this case, I just took a, just take a screenshot about our Latin language virtual laboratory. It is a sort of uh, simulation and Latin exercise in which students can just point and click asking two questions. In, in this case, the system was asking to, found, to find the pronominal forms in this text. And if a student click on the right one, the text will go on green, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, virtual labs are expensive and you cannot improvise them, but there is a solution also about this. Of course, the learning by doing, so asking students to put in practice the theoretical knowledge they probably acquired using video lectures or text or uh, live lessons, um, have a higher grade of interactivity and less flexibility and control for the student. Because usually these assignments or these uh, virtual labs specifically needs to have to run on a computer and not just on a smartphone, or if they are app, you need a smartphone, but not a computer. In this case, this is a, a virtual lab about uh, optical signals and this kind of thing. So for physics, uh, we have something also for chemistry. We do not have virtual labs for all of the courses. Also, if we have also Latin paleography, but in the cases in which we do not have a virtual lab, we can create an assignment that is useful. In my course, uh, in one of my courses, uh, there is the concept of web usability. Uh, web usability is something on a website that allow you allow the website to be perceived as effective, efficient, and satisfactory for the user. The assignment is not 
provide me a definition of usability according to IESO standard. The exercise I propose to my student is, okay, this is a list of five websites, pick one, and according to the one you choose, you have to perform these tasks, and then you have to fill in this heuristic analysis and a task analysis using these modules. I explained those things before, and then the student can really do something putting their hands on the topic. Also, uh, providing a lot of incorrect answer, but these are the occasion also to start a discussion and to start confronting and sharing with their peers on the third element that I will show you. For on interactive exercises, you can e easily use Google Form or Microsoft Form or other free tools, and these tools usually are free for schools and for universities. So if your university didn't apply for them, you can start asking for it. And it's really easy to set up a finger exercise. So just multiple choices question. Of course, we do not recommend to use them as something that provides you a real understanding of how students are going on that course on that subject. Finally, for visual labs. Our visual labs were built uh, as the result of research projects that were funded by the European Commission or by the European Space Agency uh, years ago. Um, but nowadays, and specifically with the COVID-19 emergency, a lot of institutions started providing their virtual labs for free, openly for universities. So my suggestion here is start Googling for them. These are just three examples. Virtual Labs, this is an Indian uh, initiative. Labster and Praxilabs, both their three are providing free access to their laboratories. In some cases, they are complex simulation. In other cases, they are more on the creative side and are, they are addressing STEM courses. So science, technology, uh, engineering, pretty much the one that needs uh, virtual simulation in order to let students perceive how things are working and to put in practice the theoretical knowledge that otherwise are just theories. The third element in our model is collaborative learning. Um, this, is, this is something everyone is speaking about. Uh, we have this as a mandatory activity for professors for each course. But of course, the blending of these three elements, self-paced learning, um, learning by doing, and collaborative learning is different if you compare, I don't know, mathematics one that will need a lot of exercise with uh, my course that will need a lot of collaborative learning. This depends, the specific recite, the specific blend depends on the sensitiveness of the specific professor, on the teaching style, and on the learning outcomes, of course. But as base ingredients, all of these three should be in our course provision. This is just two examples. These are the tools that now we are using an asynchronous tool, so a classic textual forum, and a synchronous tool, so our interactive class system. The asynchronous tool, the forum is a powerful tool. Okay, it's just text. You can also append an image and it's good, but it's persistent in time. So a discussion started with this class can continue with the next one next year. And it's really useful if you want to try to avoid personal emails. And I'm going to say this again in the next slide, but this is, in my opinion, important. And when we launch a discussion on the forum, usually we try to challenge students in order to make them um, manipulate the knowledge they are just acquiring, also to, to see them discussing one with the other and to understand which are the critical points, which are the difficulties they are experiencing. All of these difficulties or the needs of deepenings that they are expressing will be in the in, will be discussed and will be the topic of the interactive class system. Interactive class system is a synchronous tool, so students need to be connected at the same time in the same room. We did a lot of experimentation. We tried several platforms. And finally, we decided for some years ago for Sky for Business for a very specific reason. 
uh, we integrated in it in our platform. Microsoft asked us to do some experimentation in order to understand if Skype for Business can, could be useful also for educational context. Um, we decided for it because it allowed us to provide at least three different learning models. The first one is the renowned uh, flipped classroom and how we implement it. Since we have the self-paced um, content already prepared, we assign to students a week before of the next interactive class what they have to study. So in the next class, we will talk about the concept of psychotechnology. Please study the first three video lessons and this specific essay. So students are going to study. They have a week so they can self-organize their timing. And then in the class, I, as a professor, will not give them another frontal lesson because it has no sense. If I'm asking them to come to my classroom at the same time, they need to be the protagonist of the lesson. Because if I want just to communicate to them something, I can record it. I can record it and provide them so anyone can access to this content whenever you want. If I'm asking all the students to come in the class, they have to be the active participant of the, of the meeting. So what I do usually is preparing some challenging questions. OK, so psychotechnology is this, this, and that. So are my glasses at psychotechnology? They are impacting on my perception, and they are uh, use, impacting also on my language. What about the definition, et cetera, et cetera. So they are start discussing, and they will be they will enjoy this opportunity, not just to stare at the screen and listening to me talking, but having the opportunity to challenge themselves, to share their knowledge, to, to have an opportunity to exchange what they are thinking about a specific topic. These are just some examples. Uh, on the left, you can see me talking, OK, and a screen shared. And usually I propose to them to do a research, <clears throat> a collaborative research. So I propose a topic and I ask a group of students, it's not mandatory, to participate to this research. And I just use Google Doc. I use Google Doc. I let the people who are willing to participate to the research the access. I propose them an index, a structure of the document, propose them some source, and, they, and then I tell them what to do. And week after week in the interactive classes, we do a collective revision of what they are writing, also with the people not participating in this, in this research, in this collaborative project work. Why? Because so also the other can benefit from the work conducted by their colleagues. And also the colleagues need to have some feedback to understand if the things they are writing are correct or not. We choose Skype for Business also because of this application sharing feature that is not just a screen sharing, but if I have a program running on my computer, I can show it to my student and then say, OK, Alessandro, now continue. And I can give to him the control on the program running on my computer. And this is good for engineering and et cetera. On the right here, you have a different uh, feature of the system we chose. So the shared whiteboard. In this case, a colleague of mine, Dario Assante, proposed an, ex an exercise on the whiteboard. And a student is writing, uh, using the mouse, the circuit in order to resolve the, the, the test proposed by the professor, while the other students are commenting and watching what he is doing. So it's like calling a student to the whiteboard in a class and asking him to solve an exercise. And that's why we like it, this system. Of course, in this case, the interactivity is at the maximum level. The control is so and so, because you need to have a professor doing at least the moderator and the animator of these collaborative learning activities, both synchronous or, or asynchronous. And the flexibility is lower, because you are asking students to be connected at a very specific time. Moving faster, of course, you can find the presentation uh, online while, when it will be uploaded. A list of potential tools that can be used, but probably you are using those tools a lot in these weeks. 
try to avoid personal emails because if a question is useful for a student, probably it is useful all, also for all the other students. So ask students to ask questions on the forum. So in this way, you are creating your own knowledge base for the next classes and anyway for all the students. Another aspect beyond activities and contents is support and orientation. I will go quickly about it. We are not proposing just um, the syllabus of a course, so the objective, the program, the textbook, but we are trying to provide students different cognitive styles in presenting the information. And the concept map of the course is one of them. We have concept maps presenting both the content structure and the activities of the course for all of the courses we are providing. Of course, we are providing an exam guide and didactic planning, explaining in a linear way, in a textual way, what's in the concept map, and a fundamental tool, a shared agenda, in which the professor can add an appointment for the next week, for 15 days over, and students will be notified about it. For it, of course, you can use just Google Calendar or any similar software too. Finally, the evaluation. These are some screenshots for our student tracking system. We have learning analytics because we have an LMS, a learning management system that we designed it, that is running. So we know what student is accessing what for each of the course. We have this data also at the class level, at the academic year level, etc. But anyway, also if even if Unimetuno was prepared to online learning, because this is what we do, COVID-19 impacted also on us, because final dissertations and exams were not online since two months ago. Uh, so we need to recreate something that assure uh, a high level of security and quality to both the activities, final dissertation and especially exams, uh, in order to let our students continue studying. What we did, for example, we used the interactive class system, oral modality, so no written exams, two professors at the same time in each exam session, the student's ID sent in advance by email in order to perform the check uh, confronting the student's ID in the email of the professor and the, the face on the screen in real time without showing, without asking the students to show the ID in the meeting because we need to be compliant to GDPR and student privacy. And then the student go full screen. So anyone else on the screen, so we can see his eyes. Um, we can ask the students to have a round shooting in a room to understand if he's trying to cheat, but that, won't, that didn't happen. And what we are going to do is to design something for online exams, to moving for, to written modality too, and using proctoring tools. Proctoring tools, you cannot improvise them. There are many solutions on the market. Uh, some of them are also GDPR compliant, and they can uh, help in managing written exams, but they, usually they're asking students to have two devices connected, a computer and a smartphone. So since we want to be accessible in many sense, we are evaluating very carefully this opportunity. And that's all. Sorry if I went long, but I tried to incorporate in my presentation some of the questions I saw you already posted. And here is a very brief uh, references list. Uh, you will find the links also in the, in the presentation. And thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. Now we're starting with the questions and answers uh, session before we go to the to the break. Uh, just to start, Natalia asks, how can we form lab skills by virtual labs? Any positive experience? Lab skill enhance, like preparing solutions in tube or use some devices. <laughs> what we do usually some some of the lab exercises can be easily replicated in simulation if you think of all the measurement uh, tools are just um, perceiving an input elaborating it and providing an output 
So you just need to find the proper simulation, but they are really simply uh, implementable in a digital system. While for some other things in which you need hand to be prepared and to be trained to do some job, of course, going just online in 2020 is not enough. Probably in 2025 with optic interfaces, maybe. Uh, again, if you are if you are talking about chemistry, you can just simulate some uh, liquid and solution prepared. But then, when you go to the lab, you need also some uh, ability to manipulate actual elements. So there is still some gap in what you can simulate using the standard equipment we can ask to a student. Okay, thank you. Our colleague also from uh, Hellenic Mediterranean University, Dini Dimo, uh, asks, uh, according to your, your previous question, Alessandro, if self-learning is indeed different to collaborative learning. Well, yes, um, is indeed different, but they are, the, in my opinion, uh, ingredients of a complex recipe. So self-learning should be part of the learning orchestration that you are going to propose to your student when moving from a classroom learning to online learning. Um, in these weeks, what we saw, and I don't know, probably you already saw it in Educo's review, they highlighted the difference uh, between online learning, so a structured, designed, um, complex activity that has a lot of preparation with emergency remote teaching. That is what usually has been done because probably everyone just try to move on the online side what they are used to do in classroom. Mm -hmm. Doing online learning will ask you also to rethink to what can be self-learning, probably your video lesson or some content that stu students can study on their own and what need to be uh, live, what need to be discussed in an interactive classroom and things like that. And this uh, rethinking of your learning, of your learning delivery, let's say, will improve, in my opinion, dramatically also the way you are going to teach online because separating and structuring what can be done autonomously by students, probably before meeting them again and what and why they will need you online in some case one-on-one -on -one, and many cases in my opinion uh, you with all the classroom connected will make the difference okay thank you another one this is very specific but i think it's a very extended concern particularly for medicine and nursing mm. so any idea for visual labs in medicine and nursing i have some but you have to consider that medicine and nursing are in the sh really short list of the, let's say, courses, or degree programs that an online university cannot provide in Italy. Mm -hmm. And there is a reason why, not for the <laughs> courses, but for the internships, because at least in Italy, medicine is a six year degree with at least two or three years spent in the hospital. And we cannot provide that kind of uh, experience online. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of initiative about um, telemedicine and online remote health and remote medicine. And most of them, if you search for them on Google or on the web, will provide you also some virtual lab. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we have uh, one or two more minutes for the last questions. Uh, do we have, uh, let's say, the best way to providing online oral exams, especially in mathematics? Later on, our colleagues from, from La Laguna, Israel and Rodrigo will probably uh, let us know a little bit uh, about this, but what's your opinion around uh, My opinion is that mathematics is one of the five or six courses that is challenging us to move to the written form. We were used to provide mathematics exam with a open questions or problem to be solved, applied the theorem and the knowledge the students studied in the months before. In the oral exam, 
what they did now, what our professor uh, managed to do is not just asking questions, but ask students to uh, point out on the paper or to share the screen and to solve an exercise directly in, live, in a live session. That's why we want to move on the written form, at least from, for a subset of the courses we are providing. Because oral exam, in my opinion at least, it's not enough for specific uh, courses like physics, mathematics, probably also chemistry, and many others. Okay. So another from Irini Dimov is on online examination is indeed an issue that bothers all of us at this point in Greece and how to handle hundreds of students in one course through an online exam. During a lot of separated uh, session, this, I personally, I managed 130 students in the last month, but I didn't manage them all in the same day. We have two, three hour session in the morning for a lot of days in order to manage them well. Uh, you have to consider it at least in Italy, but I think everywhere. Uh, exam should be public, so also other students can join to the conversation. So you need to choose the correct tool also to manage the difference among um, the controller, the, how to say, the presenter, the professors, and the participants in order to kick out someone who is disturbing or to manage the microphones, etc. But mm -hmm. large audiences and large classes will need separated session distributed in time and this uh, liquidity you will find it also in providing your teaching your classes this will force you to reschedule and to think about scheduling in a more liquid way too. okay thank you alessandro uh, costas i think we are on time for mm -hmm. the break uh, yes, uh, there are some other questions around evaluation online and ex okay, examination. But this is not a problem because our next speaker also comes uh, from Italy, from another online university. So please so, keep some of these questions for the next speaker. So that's it. as Ricardo has mentioned, we would like to appreciate the comments that we have received during the first the evaluation of the first uh, webinar. So we're going to have a short break here, but not without doing anything. Uh, we are going to uh, I'm going to share my screen and we are going to vote and we would like to map uh, your profile as a participant. This is a reason of uh, what we are going to work, what we are going to do right now as a break. So I would like all of you to go to mendy.com and I will share my screen and together we will do uh, this uh, uh, exercise and this voting as a short break before we continue with the two last uh, uh, talks. So I'm sharing my screen, um, share my screen, share, and uh, I will go to, to this kind. So please go to mendy.com, use this code 431934, and we should start, you know, the profile, uh, your um, uh, registration of your profile. We would like to know uh, the profile of our attendees. Uh, so we are going to be very glad if you participate as a short break be, uh, between uh, this, uh, this uh, today's very interesting talks. So uh, if we are ready, uh, I would like to vote and tell us uh, if you are a teacher and trainer or if you are from administration point of view, you can press, uh, you can vote for no. So we are around 400 participants, and this is very good because we kept this number until now very constant. Uh, so I'm expecting at least, you know, like 300 uh, people to vote before I move to the next uh, slide. This helps us uh, very much in order to plan and engineer, let's say, uh, the profile of the presenters and the lecturers that we are going to invite in future uh, events that uh, we plan based on the needs of our ecosystem. Um, so uh, we are going to feel very honored if you participate and uh, tell us your opinion and vote along this voting
You can access uh, uh, www.medi.com through your mobile, through your computer. It's very easy uh, uh, accessed site. So I think now I will move to the next uh, slide. Uh, where are your universities based? This is an open access. You can type the country that your university, your institution is located, Lo your university locates. I think that we have attendees all over the world. And this is very nice. So I'm going to wait in another 30 seconds on this transparency. Please vote. So we are moving to the other one with which university you are affiliated. So you can type the university that you are coming from, like Hellenic Mediterranean University, University of Barcelona, uh, IPP, Univers oh, Liverpool Hope University. So we, Yerevan, yes, we have a lot of participants actually from Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine. I mean, Very nice. We are very honored that we have even participants from uh, Western Africa. I said that we had participants from the Hellenic Mediterranean University, but I cannot see my university among you know the participants. And I cannot vote. So let's wait for 30 more seconds on this uh, transparency. Let's move to what do you expect? Uh, what do you expect from this webinar? 
I mean, this question also was on the first um, voting that we have performed along the first webinar on the 27th of April. You can vote, you can have the option to vote more options. And please, uh, at the end of the webinar, don't forget to evaluate us. You can find the evaluation form through our website. And this is very essential. Uh, we have studied a lot of, of the comments uh, that you have made uh, along the uh, regarding the first webinar session. And we have tried to uh, follow uh, some of the comments that we have received. And we will do the same for the next and uh, final round of this webinar on in online teaching on the 7th of May. So we appreciate a lot your time and uh, your evaluation is something very, very important for us. So let's wait another 15 seconds on this. So let's move to the other one. When teaching online, I feel what are your feelings as a teacher uh, along your online teaching uh, activities? I mean, these uh, feelings they can be uh, they can be your feelings during the preparation of your online course, during the online uh, lecture, and afterwards. Regarding your question uh, for the webinar on the 27th of April, the webinar is already available through our website. So if you scroll down to our website, you can find the link and you can follow again the first webinar. Uh, the same uh, policy and the same strategy will be followed uh, also for the second webinar. So, I mean, by tomorrow or let's say in, uh, by Wednesday, uh, the links uh, and all the recordings regarding the second webinar uh, will be also available through our website. Let's wait another 10 seconds. So let's move to the other one. This is the first webinar on online teaching that you attend. I mean, if you have followed the first one, our first round, the, the answer should be no.
there is a great competition between yes and no regarding this question. Thank you for voting. As I told you, this is very useful uh, for us. But the most useful thing is to evaluate us after the end of each webinar. We're extracting very useful information in order to engineer the next event even better or as best as we can. Okay, let's move to the, the other one. Think, what is your experience on online teaching? I would like to learn how experienced you are on the online teaching or how much unexperienced you are. We would like also to check uh, what was the impact of COVID-19 on your teaching uh, habits. Let's wait another 15 seconds on this question. Please vote. So let's move to the other one. Name some tools, platforms you have worked with, with, we mean along your uh, online teaching, what kind of uh, technology you have used. Um, you can say Moodle, you can say Zoom, you can say Skype, uh, WebEx, Teams. Blackboard is also used to be one of the first tools along the online teaching. Google Classroom. Let's place one minute for closing this question. Thank you for voting, all of you. Thank you. And um, how do you find online teaching? I think this is one question before the end. Let's place the, the, the countdown.
very well. It's very interesting that we have even one uh, reply that is useless, the online teaching. I, I would like to interview this colleague of us. It's very interesting, uh, this kind of option. And um, uh, what do you struggle the most with along the online teaching? You have more options here. You can vote more options. You can vote everything. Let's place again the... Thank you very much for voting. And don't forget after this uh, webinar to evaluate the second round. If you have not evaluated the first round of our webinar, please do it. You do not you do not evaluate you are not asked to evaluate our speakers all of them uh, they are experts uh, excellent according to our selection criteria uh, you're evaluating the organization and uh, the way that we deliver this webinar uh, this is very useful for us uh, to exploit to leverage the expertise of our speakers with an optimum uh, way Thank you. And this is the last one. Uh, uh, did you participate uh, on the in the twenty seventh of April webinar? I will appreciate you know to vote uh, on this question the most as possible. So I will press the one minute uh, countdown before we will continue with our next two. Um, talks along this uh, webinar and um, a lot of people you are asking uh, about the uh, doctor Elif Benku Elif will be with us on uh, Thursday again see we had to uh, uh, transfer her uh, lecture uh, on Thursday for Thursday uh, for organizational purposes. So thank you for voting. Everything will be shared with you. Uh, so I stop sharing. I'm moving back to the stream yard. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your voting. Uh, it was excellent for us. Don't forget to evaluate us uh, after the end of this webinar. So I think that uh, we will continue now with our next um, speaker. Our next speaker um, comes uh, from Italy again. I mean, I think Italy and Spain is our favorite uh, countries along the second run of this webinar. Uh, yes. Daniele Baredin is um, also participates in the Athena European Consortium of Universities. Uh, he's a very good colleague of us, uh, a friend. He has visited uh, Hellenic Mediterranean University last year. Um, he has an experience as a colleague regarding online teaching. So a lot of questions that uh, very successfully, Alessandro, I have to say that he addressed a lot of, of the questions that he has made with, to him. Uh, the rest of the questions, I think that Daniele will deal. Uh, so, Daniele, the floor is yours. Please share your screen. You have 20 yes. minutes, up to 20 minutes, and then, you know, let's leave quest uh, time for the uh, attendees to ask. Thank you very much to be with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Costas, for introducing me, and thank you to you and Ricardo for organizing uh, this uh, this day. And uh, I want to thank you all the people which are watching us in this uh, strange and terrible moments so just give me seconds to share my presentation okay 
sorry. Okay. I hope it's fine. So, as Costa say, I am, I work from Unicusano, which is a university in Rome. And okay, I give this uh, title learning online model when also I started to to think about which kind of support I can give to this uh, to this online conference. So, very briefly, this is, this is me and the university in Nicola Cusano in Rome. I work in the Department on uh, Electronic Engineering. I'm a computational physics and my field of research is nanotechnology. So, uh, as Costa say, I am now an um, assistant professor in an uh, online university. But of course, uh, before of this, I have experience in uh, a traditional university, as uh, face-to-face, if you want to say. Uh, so I can compare the two situations. And also, I would say that in um, Unicusano, we started as a pure online university. But then in the last year, we have also a campus in Rome, and we have face-to-face -face lessons, so traditional teaching. In this uh, here, we have a board of this uh, methodology together. So of course, when uh, all the situation started, uh, somehow we already have all the tools and all the instruments and in our platform, which normally we use together with the uh, traditional. So we always use the two methodology together. Uh, I'm not a, an expert of uh, pedagogy, of course, so I, I will try to, 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 to keep this talk in a very informal, trying to, to give some, uh, some tips and suggestions concerning my experience. Because uh, I, I would say that I have learned to become a, an online teacher. Of course, I, we had some courses at the beginning, but also the experience is, is, is important in this field. So I hope that what I have learned uh, it could be useful for some of you. Uh, of course, here we have all the group involved. So I just want to start from some interesting data. And this is very an interesting study it was a few years ago from Columbia University concerning online uh, teaching compared to, let's say, regular or face-to-face -face or traditional. So according to this study, the students, uh, if you compare frontal and online, they used to have lower performance. There were higher failure rates for online. And uh, teachers also had the tendency to perform worse in online course. And uh, it was uh, I'm more unlikely to get a final degree. And uh, of course, uh, there, there were a lot of problems also in the evaluation. So, this and also will show something about this uh, the studies of Colombia. This tell us the uh, first thing: online teaching is difficult and it's different. It's quite different, I would say, from face to face. Of course, uh, they have something in common. We are always, we are always mm, discussing about teaching, but there are some uh, some aspects, some point that uh, have to be very clear both uh, to the teacher and to the student. In fact. For example, at first, when they were interviewed, students, they used to say that they can easily manage online lessons because they can manage their time, because uh, everything's there. Of course, uh, especially if we are talking of asynchronous uh, lessons. So this is the, the feeling that the students used to have concerning, they normally start with this. And this, uh, I can tell you, it's true. I've experienced with a lot of my students. Students have the tendency to think that online it will be easier. Not because of the lessons are easier or uh, there is some tricks or whatever. Just because they can better organize their time, time schedule. But this is not, this is not really true. It is something that we, when you teach online, you have to make it clear to the students. To, to follow online courses, the, the student needs some non-academic non skills. And one of these is to manage time. Not to think that 
they have all the time of the world. But I think that they've organized else as they are in a face-to-face -face course with lessons every day. So even if they're following uh, with asynchronous lessons, they have to keep in mind this important point. Organization of online courses for students is difficult. This I want to underline. I have experience. I, I have experienced a lot of students. They thought, okay, they can, we can do it. Uh, even if I work in the morning, for example, because uh, they could be, for example, useful for students working. This I'm talking in normal situation, not now with this pandemic. And uh, they thought like that. And then when the exam came, they were not ready for the final exam. Another point of view is, of course, so they, in their teacher structure, they need to be confident with this kind of technology. And I'm, I'm not thinking about the tools we are, that we mentioned now with this, uh, Teams or, uh, or, or whatever. It's just there are a lot of uh, instruments and tools that can be used in online teaching. And this is important. It's important, and I will talk more later about this, to, as, as I wrote here, engage students in a virtual space. This virtual, it became very important. And students need to have their appropriate support. And they have to learn how to, to manage autonomy and this uh, time management. So another point, and this is from the point of view of the teachers, is uh, empathy. OK, you, I, I guess uh, every teacher I would say every good teacher ex experiences his uh, own life. Uh, this the, the empathy with the students. If you are a good teacher in a classroom, you, normally you feel if the students are following you, or they are just lost somewhere between uh, Mars and Jupiter. You you can see from the face, you know, you, you get you can get this ha ha. I got it. What you're talking about? I can understand you. Keep on with this, or. No, they're completely lost in this face that you you can you can see that not absolutely nothing they are not understanding what they are talking about. Okay, this in somehow you have to forget to forget because even if you are doing online with synchronous, okay, normally you will have 10, 20, I don't know, 40 small screen, and it will be very difficult to get uh, also facial expression and also to get an immediate uh, feedback from the student. And of course, if we are thinking about uh, asynchronous lectures, of course, you cannot get this. So you have to provide some tools, some environments to get this feedback. It's really important. Otherwise, you are keeping on with the course of for weeks uh, and you're pro approaching the exams and the students are not following you. Very connected to this is what is important. You have to be very clear when you present your course, when you put some instruction of your course, presentation, introduction, when you put all your tools, your book, uh, slides. You have to be very careful to give the, the right messages. What is really important? In, 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 uh, in your lesson, your course, what uh, you think is fundamental for the students, what is something that they, they cannot avoid to know, what uh, they have to practice more. Because normally, if you're in the class, you can immediately give them the feeling, what is important. They, with your voice, uh, you can specify. There are a lot of, there are thousands of ways. They trust you. But then in this, uh, in this way, they they need some extra insights in order to have your feed your feedback as a teacher this is very important just do not get students lost in somewhere during the course this is interesting also this came from an interview from this columbia study is have availability of course uh, even if you're always there if you feel if you answer in one hour, one day, two days, and you're, you're up there, you're there on... on uh... Sometimes the students can feel that they are somehow alone.
because they are not in the, in the class with you. Someone said today, uh, you, can meet, you can meet a student at, at, the cafe, at the cafe at your university, you can talk with him. So if you are in a face-to-face -face in a traditional university, online you do not have this. So this is important to provide some tools, some constant feedback and some, uh, some way to, to have a sort of uh, the tendency of the students and what they need. So this is another point. So going a little bit on particular, uh, I mentioned you have to be clear because you have to, to be clear of what you want from the students in, this, in your course. You have to describe what, they are, what you are going to teach and especially more, not to, to be much, uh, com, I'm going to say, self-centered, but just to try to, to explain to the students what do you want from them. So be the much more possible clear. So, for example, I had put some examples. It, of course, this came from physics, but this model, this is very generic. This model, the students will introduce the fundamental principle of heat transmission. Okay, and what is this? So they will be able to understand and illustrate the fundamental physics. They will be able to apply this principle for this, for this, for this. What they, what I knew, what, why I need this. If I, I'm a student, I have to, to understand why I need this, uh, with what I'm going to do with this, and so on. And also description, the script, the, the so-called descriptor, sometimes cannot be immersed. So you have to be very, very clear. Also, I put some example. So not importance of the question of the motion, which is the important, important, sorry. You have to specify, to in, just, you have to, to give them the perfect, uh, I mean, uh, situation for this equation or for whatever you are teaching. So more clear than that you are used to be. It's a sort of mental change. Because, okay, you, normally we write program, the students have to do this, then this, and this. But if you do not have a everyday discussion and, and uh, presence with the student, uh, you have to, to be a little bit ahead with your mind and think which, what kind of question, what kind of problem they will experience. experience. So everything should be clear. Another point is, for course, and I will mention a little bit, is evaluation. So, of course, you have some uh, outcomes, you have some objectives that the students have to reach. But uh, concerning what you need, what you think these are objective, you have to be very precise. You have to, sh you have to choose the, the right evaluation tool. And, uh, and about this, uh, I want to do. I want to be very clear. It, also, according to my experience, only a final exam is not enough. You have to put some some measurements, some uh, activities during your course, and I will mention now, in order to understand the level, in order to to get some uh, information accurate and uh, specific every day, every week uh, about the, the level of your students. Because uh, with online teaching, uh, only a, a final exam is not enough. And I would say, especially now that we are forced to have uh, oral exam at home. Because also in, for in our case, for Unicusano, we have, of course, uh, online teaching, but before of this uh, pandemic, we used to have exams in face-to-face -face at the university. So now we have moved. But apart from this situation, which uh, increase uh, this, I would say, danger not to get uh, the, 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 the real, the real um, evaluation from the students, also in a normal situation with online teaching, you have to provide some evaluation tool during the path of the students in your teaching. So, of course, uh, first of all, uh, now try to get more specific. Of course, you have the, some usual tools. So you have lessons, book, tutorial, laboratory, as we said. 
and uh, worker group i will focus on this a little bit more and uh, be careful of be focused on learning activity of the students and uh, to put all the activity in the activity that uh, could help the students according to the descriptor and the goals and the objective that you mentioned in your exam and one of the problems sometimes is uh, the which I, i'm trying to avoid today is a poor use of visual effect as you see it's death by powerpoint i get everyone has experience in a normal conference it could be a speaker which maybe is talking about a very interesting argument but they, but maybe is presented with this slides which are basically flu, full of speaking and the question things like that so without a, a visual effect and, and this is the death of the audience of course and you have to think about this when you are teaching online you have to attract the attention because uh, as i mentioned teaching and uh, learning online is uh, it's also demanding it's, uh, i've experienced i am experienced this that uh, it's it's more tiring for the students to be concentrate also for the teacher so you have to be careful to in a way to attract the students so i will mention how is uh, basically is working how, uh, how our uh, teaching activity in unicusano and that is quite general in italy about this structure here i i wrote provided i could not find a, a better one in english because in italy we have another word which uh, it's there is not uh, the same word in english but uh, i hope that uh, i will uh, explain clear in, in a couple of minutes so you have provided teaching you have interactive teaching you have of course independent study and then at the end you have all of this which is the workload for the students workload that of course is not supposed to be overload which is another big problem of online teaching something that you have to be very careful so I mentioned this is the e-learning approach in Italy so we have this uh, classification I would say provided activity and interactive activity always being careful that the workload in say the homework are not too much that they're not pushing down the student so let's let's explain better what, what are these provide activity and interactive okay they provide teaching it's something which is the most uh, most familiar to everyone because it's uh, first of all it's lessons when we are talking of uh, about uh, online teaching so this provided teaching is both asynchronous lessons so you have your recorder your lesson in for example in unicusano all the courses they have all the lesson uh, i mean there the students can even if he's following online synchronous he has also already there stored the complete course in order to follow it again in order to have some uh, clarification is in his own mind and things like that so here we have asynchronous synchronous could be web conference front or whatever and uh, very important uh, what is equivalent media scorm uh, what is this scorm probably you have heard about this is some uh, multimedia object because of course uh, to have uh, also a synchronous lesson with a book that you are just com just uh, i mean explain we just commenting it's, it it could be mm, very difficult and also and much more in asynchronous lessons because you have to to put something that could be not only useful but also interesting and uh, attractive for the students so scorma is kind of a, a sort of a multimedia object when you can put slide some uh, lateral comments uh, some links uh, to other stuff uh, some test uh, during so first evaluation Just put some test small question during the, the the lessons in order to immediately check the attention and the understanding of the students so uh, of course and in this scorm you also can also put movie and the links to an external file and whatever 
So it, it should be as, as, as more as uh, complete as possible. These are what we call in Italy provided lesson. So the, the addition of asynchronous and synchronous lessons. You have to be careful that uh, if you if the, the, your course has too much provided lessons respect to the interactive that I'm going to, to talk in a, a little, probably your course will be too much too much demanding for the student to be too theor theoretical to be too hard to manage also consider these uh, which is that is this one to three so if you have uh, half an hour of lesson let's say let's say for example half an hour of asynchronous lesson then you have to think uh, that the, the students uh, for the student it will be one on one hour and a half to get it because you have to listen one and then you have, you have to repeat to understand. And normally there is this estimation is one tree. So it's important to consider this in, in order to have the, the right number of, of material and credits and whatever. So this provided teaching is the most traditional. Then you have fundamental for the online is the interactive learning. Essentially, that you have to include to in, increase the interaction uh, with the students, which will help you to evaluate them. So, you, of course, you will have forum when they, they talk with you and with other students. They can listen to teacher suggestion. You can give other exercise. You can discuss, of course, about synchronous discussion, whatever. Number three, fundamental. What we call activity. Activity is, just means uh, electronic activity. So, in my course, I, in both, I, I have two courses: one of general physics, and one of uh, solid state electronic. I have this activity. So it's something that uh, uh, students can ask of. I, I give uh, in my platform is something that the students has to do at home alone. It could be a project, for example, for, for uh, master students, for students who are in the in the two years of the master. I don't know, starting from uh, some theory, trying to develop something or something more specific. For example, to to develop an algorithm in order to have a simulation. I'm a computational physicist, or uh, things like that. It is a is a small project. They have to do using what have they have learned in your course. In Italy, these are compulsory for online courses. You cannot have only a uh, final evaluation. Of course, uh, the student, uh, he, can, he can decide. So they are compulsory for the teacher. They're not compulsory for the student. He can decide to skip them. But of course, uh, this will not help him for a final evaluation. But they are compulsory for the teacher. So we have to provide appropriate activity uh, for the students to do it during the course and also they can be divided in different parts for example if you're now normally our courses are divided in different module so you can you can have activity for the for first module more specific uh, for the second and so on and maybe a final project and then final evaluation so this number three i will stress it's very important i suggest you to, to have it in the online course then you, we have also self-assentiment test. This I, I have in my platform a lot of tests with a lot of multiple choice questions. I, after they finish the study one module, the students can go through this and check if it's, or if it's okay, if you, if you understood what was in the lesson, if it's at the, if you got all the message, and it could be very, and it's something that just is just for the student. It's not something that I'm going to check because it, it's, uh, it's a test that at the end they have final answer, uh, they can understand where they were wrong or right and so on. And also, we can, they can be possible to, to test during the course. And uh, finally, number six, also very important that I put in red, virtual classes. It's uh, important, and I would say now it's fundamental in this period of pandemic, to create in your platform a virtual class for the students. What does it mean? It's just a place where the students can go. It's also not important that the teacher is there. 
but it's, it's just a real class where after the lesson the, the students can talk with each other just just can compare the experience what they did understand what they did understand did not understand and uh, uh, if there are the doubts they can discuss it because it's important the interaction between the students the, the teacher can be sort of moderator you can uh, for example I have some virtual class they the students write then their message. It's a both forum and also normal message. I'm just a sort of moderator. If there are some special question, I can uh, write something. But normally, these virtual classes are a space for the student. As the the I would say uh, after the the as the class after the break, something like that. And also in my experience, this is important for the students. Uh, and I, I would say now, as I said, very important now in this period because uh, they, it can, I think it could be also a psychological support in this period of pandemic. They, they do not feel to be alone. I hope this is very important. Okay, I, here I just wrote uh, some of the tools that uh, can be used, and uh, but a lot of them are very common. Some of them are more specific. I'm not going through all of it. So, People can can check if they can ask questions, of course. So uh, exams uh, now, I, because I, I discussed also with the organizers, and uh, which are the, the most uh, common questions from people which uh, is attending this uh, meeting. Uh, I will just talk about my experience. Uh, I, I, I don't want to say that these are uh, sort of general truth. This is what we are trying to experience at uh, engineering in our uh, in our Unicusano. So these are suggestions that we give to the teachers after discussing uh, between us, among us. Uh, of course, uh, we don't uh, completely different from uh, the Alessandro who spoke bef before me. We decide to keep written exam. And just to to put them in different way according to the number of the students. So suggestion is to have uh, if you have more than forty students, is to have uh, some uh, 30, 45 minute uh, tests which are already in the platform. We have a software, so the tests are there. When there is the sum, uh, um, the students can go through it. So everything is uh, basically automatic. You also do do not have to to correct uh, everything. This could be good for some exams. It could be not as good for others when uh, people need to think. But somehow you can try to to model the, the questions also according to something for that you have to solve from a mathematical physics point of view. It could be a question that you have to solve and then to find the right answer. For example, uh, between fifteen and forty students. Uh, we have a, a longer 60 90 minutes platform test could be separating more tests so that uh, teacher can manage uh, all the tests uh, during the time the students are doing the other tests and if you have less students of course you can we can decide to keep on with the standard reading exam i, I would say that this is the, the solution i i chose uh, even if i more than 15 because, uh, but physics, I think it's the, the the best solution. Of course, there there are a lot of um, way try to make the exam clear, fair, and whatever. Alessandro talked about this in this in the previous talk. More cameras, and uh, of course, I asked the student to send all the documents uh, the day before, so that the, the day of the exam I can check. I already have the documents. I can check if the if the person is talking with me is the, is is exactly there. And is not another person doing the exam and things like that. It's not easy, of course, uh, uh, because a uh, lot of students on the exam. It's it's uh, it's uh, tough. I don't know. I hope that I can help in case there are more specific questions. I can try to answer. Finally, last last slide. It's about laboratory. Uh, here I'm a little bit pessimistic. Uh, okay, I'm not uh, um, an experimentalist. I mean, I, I'm a computer theoretical computational physics physicist. So my 
my research is simulation modeling of uh, existing uh, experimental problems. So I'm not really experienced of lab. I, I discuss this uh, this point with a lot of my colleagues. Uh, what uh, came out are more the problems than the, the solutions. I would I will I would hope that this uh, pandemic could be an effort also to improve this. Um, you know, uh, every every time the you, you mankind is, is going across a, a serious problem, uh, there there is a, a strong and fast acceleration in the, in the progress. So I really hope that this can help. To, de to develop a real virtual lab because at the moment uh, in our experience uh, especially from my experimental colleague there are too few tools to do real virtual laboratory and a lot of them they are simulator from exercise not really experience lab experiences and uh, what is missing in these tools normally is the, the possibility of be of uh, doing mistakes mistakes in in <laughs> In, in the sense of procedure of uh, of an experiment, uh, because uh, as a lot of you may know, doing a mistake for a, especially for a student from uh, uh, also a graduate for a PhD student is the best the best way to understand something and to find a good solution or or even a better solution than the, the one who, which was provided. So this troubleshooting is uh, at the moment according to us not really provided for the existing virtual lab but i don't know maybe i'm wrong if someone is aware of something more but okay so this basically is the end of my presentation i really i would like to thank you now i just close it and uh, stop thank you very much uh, sure. Daniele, for your contribution and your nice presentation so now it's time for questions. Yes. Uh, please, uh, the audience started. Uh, okay, they will have the first one. Uh, how can you tell if the person taking an, an exam, an electronic exam, like an exam through online, is really there? It is not someone else. It's something that a lot of people are asking. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. This is the main point. Uh, this is also the way, the, 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 the reason that uh, even if we are a, an online university before of the, of the, of the pandemic, uh, we have face-to-face uh, -face exams. Uh, you have to to provide some uh, well, some suggestions. There are to use two cameras, but uh, you have to be the students have to have, uh, for example, mobile on cameras in, in order to 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 basically to give the the rooms and everything like that, uh, and uh, it's. Um, it's, it, it is the main point, uh, but uh, you, of course, uh, it's impossible. They have to do a to have to have a camera, of course, and you have to be. It should be possible for you to watch it, what they are doing. In the end, of course, uh, we are we are not uh, sort of uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, exactly. There. So, uh, what I, you know, um, I think that sometimes we should uh, follow the U.S. Uh, model that if you try to cheat. This is something that blames for you the rest of your life. That's true. I, I That's true. We should follow some good policies from the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I also, I, I also say to the students, uh, uh, my dears, if you are, if you try to cheat, it, it's the worst for you. What you, what you are going to learn from this? When you will be an engineer, you don't know how to solve a problem. Which is going to come to help you? There is another also. question here. Yeah. How do you uh, access, uh, assess? the workload of the students while teaching online. Do you use the same quality assurance measures as using traditional teaching and learning? Yes, basically, the, as I mentioned, uh, is that it's basically the same, but you have to to be careful of the all the uh, different aspects that you put, because it's not only lessons, so it's not only the, uh, the workload of the lessons, but you, ha you have to, for example, in our case, uh, ATVT, which I mentioned, they have a weight of this of this workload. So we have some parameters. There is a lot of literature about this, in how to put the the number of lessons, the number of activity, and things like that. Thank you, Daniel. And the last one, I think, for the time being, uh, until the next uh, question will appear. 
Uh, will you choose online teaching and use face-to-face -face for coaching tasks? What is your approach? Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm, uh, I think that uh, in future, when it be possible, the, the, the joint, I mean, the, the, the connection of the two aspects are, uh, are fundamental. So it is something that uh, I hope that we are, uh, we are going this direction. So to, I, I think that online uh, teaching can really support uh, teaching because if we have a lot of tools. I'm sure that this, in this period uh, there will be an improvement of all the tools, as I mentioned, for the labs. Mm -hmm. And then last one, uh, in the online examination of a large class, is it like you are assessing one student at a time? Is it not going to be too long? Yeah, well, if you do oral, that's true. If you are doing a written exam, of course, they can do at the same time. And of course, of course, it will take your time to check uh, all the students. What if they finish, they, they, have to, they have to send to you and uh, you have to check that everyone is finished and the center, uh, you have to provide that uh, the, you have the, the final exam. It takes, yeah, unfortunately, it takes a lot of time. Maybe with better tools, but uh, it takes a lot of time. I, I, there is no very practical solution for this, I'm afraid. Uh, first time I did the uh, oral, uh, this, sorry, I did the online exams. I started in the morning and I finished finish in the night. And I promise that this is the last one. Uh, can you suggest <laughs> no online? Uh, can you can you suggest online questionnaire tools for free? Oh. Yeah, well, there I would like uh, also to inform the attendees that uh, the rest of the questions they will be asked by our uh, by our speakers after the end of the webinar. So we are going to uh, we are collecting all the questions. We are going to send them, and uh, you are going. We are going to have a QA session, offline QA session through our website. So Daniel, the floor is yours. No, yeah, uh, no, there is. I I use a couple of softwares, but uh, sorry, at the moment I don't remember. But uh, I did something. I can check. Sorry, it's for free. Yeah, 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 for free, for free. No, but I, I can share. No, no, no. There are, there are a lot of tools. There are very simple, uh, uh, very simple language that you just put the question. Uh, I can check it. Uh, we can put in the webinar, of course. Uh, sorry, that moment I don't remember the Thank something you. I did some times ago. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you Costas. Thank you very much, Daniele. And we're moving now to the last lecture. The last lecture comes, uh, it's a contribution from the University of La Laguna. Uh, it uh, comes uh, from uh, Israel, uh, Israel, uh, Israel and uh, Rodrigo. Uh, the, the, I think that the attraction regarding this presentation, and I think that Ricardo also agrees, that these two colleagues of us is like colleagues like us, like me and the majority of you. They are not online experts, so they will share their experience as normal people, let's say, like not experts in the online. So this makes their presentation uh, uh, more uh, appealing, let's say, I mean, more to earth for us. Uh, I will say, Rodrigo, to switch off your, um, uh, your microphone because I can hear your wife from the background. <laughs> uh, so the presentation uh, has been video recorded by these two colleagues of us. Uh, uh, it will be played by from my computer, and then we will have all the time to discuss with uh, both of them. And I'm telling them they are very good presenters. As of course, you know the rest of the presenters that we have selected. This is one of the criteria uh, that uh, we had. So, I mean, I don't know if the two gentlemen from the Canary Islands, they would like to say something before I play the video. Now, Rodrigo, you can unmute yourself. All right. So let me share my screen and um, uh, play the music. Hope that I will mind you. Give us the opportunity to participate in this webinar. And our speech is going to split in two parts. The first one, I'm going to talk about continuous assessment in online teaching. And then my colleague Rodrigo is going to talk about uh, some experience that he has about the changing from a face to face model to uh, an online teaching. So let's start with the continuous assessment and online teaching. 
Recently, we have to move from a face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching because of the coronavirus uh, crisis. But this change is something that uh, is not only a change of uh, work of environment, it implies a deep reflection uh, if we want to do it in a correct direction. The first point I want to make uh, you to see is that the online teaching focus a lot in the learning. So I prefer to call them remote learning for that. Okay, when, when we move from a model, which is face-to-face, -face, uh, to an, another kind of model that is uh, where we can see the, the, the pupils every, every day, or the students every day, we have to think about some aspects uh, about the learning and the teaching. One aspect would be the material to be talked. We have to uh, change, redesign, or look for a different material in the website. Another point that we have to think about is the students engage. We have to know if the material we are preparing is good for them and they uh, promote and their learning, okay? The other question is about the connection because we don't see the students every day and we need to be connected to them to know every uh, learning or need they have. Another aspect would be the technology, but not only the technology that we know, but also if we are prepared to make everything that we, we want to do. But as a teacher, I think that's something that gives us a lot of uh, things that we have to think about is the exams, the exams for the tests. We are very worried about that. And everything gives us a lot of stress. But here I want to say that it's not only a teacher's stress, but also a uh, student's stress. They are stressed as well as us, okay? In a different way, but they are all stressed. So when we move to this kind of teaching in uh, remote learning, we, if we do it very quick without any uh, reflection behind that, uh, it's something that uh, is similar to to have a, a stage coach with a turbine on it. So it, it doesn't have any any sense. So we have to uh, make some reflections about what we want them to do, how are they going to learn, and how are we going to make sure that what they have learned. So in this point, we are going to talk about exams and we are going to focus on that. So the exams makes us uh, very stressed because we have two main questions we want to, to answer. Which, what kind of exams do we have to use in this situation? And how can we sure about the integrity of the, the exams we make? So for that, two questions, or those two questions, I think we have to uh, suggest that there is a kind of assessment that is good and can solve both questions, which is the continuous assessment. But what do we mean about continuous assessment? Of course, there is not a, a continually evaluating the student, but it's to think about how can we make several kinds of assessments in different moments and uh, with different objects to assess in the way that will make your students show their proficiency or competence and how they improve their learning in the subjects. So uh, it's something that we have to think about. For that, I think we, we should um, follow three steps to make a strong continuous assessment and that give us a lot of information about the learning of the students. 
First of all, we have to think about the essential requirements with our subjects and the intended learning outcomes. What we mean by essential assessment and requirements are the old outcomes, skills, knowledge, or attitudes, or students must demonstrate with or without using accommodations. And the intended learning outcomes are all the outcomes that the student should be able to know, do, and value by the end of the course. When we have defined these uh, these things, the essential requirements and the intended learning outcomes, then you have to move to select uh, one kind of exam that can give us a lot of information and is very, uh, uh, we can do it in this situation because we are unable to assemble in person. So uh, we suggest the take home exams as a as a way to do this kind of exams. This is the second step. And the third uh, step is to think about the cognitive demand that we want them to do uh, along the exams. Because it's not the same if we want them to remember something or if we want them to understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, or create. Here, all these verbs come from the mm, Bloom's taxonomy and give us a model of an uh, exam. When we think about this verb, we can adapt what is the question we are going to introduce in the task. Here we have an example. For example, if I want to make a remember a uh, take-home exam, well, an example could be to recall laws associated to probability. Here, the simple assessment would be a multi-choice question. But if we want them, we have to prepare with the instructional strategy oriented to that kind of assessment. Okay. So another example could be if we want them to do something that is uh, going to show us if they understand, for example, discuss uh, design sing single table database, we can give them to a group of data in a database and create a report. But then in the instructional strategy, we have to orient it to that kind of assessment. For example, making exercises from the lab to practice various steps. And the last example could be if we want them to evaluate. We can give them an access to a population, a lot of data, and they have to make, a, a, for example, a report. Okay. So, but in this simple strategies, we have to make some case studies of different population risk, population, or whatever. Okay. To finish my uh, speech, I want to talk now about the non protector exams. Research here suggests some uh, ideas of what to do that give us some. Um, integrity in our exams for example the first thing that give us is that we have to make build a report uh, in your new course environment and students the way that they can to ask you some things in a in, with a confidence and with a you know in a, a, a good um, climate okay the second step would be to share with your students why academic integrity is important, but not only for the teacher or for the academy, but for the future, okay, and for them. The third one would be to share with the with your student what is expected from them and how the assessment supports their learning. And it's important that they know that the assessment is also a part of their learning, not something to check the knowledge, okay? And the last one is to ask your students to agree with a sign and sign a honor code 
before the exam. These are something that it could be very good for the uh, and non protector exams. And now um, Rodrigo is going to tell us his experience when he changed from a face to face uh, uh, teaching to an online teaching. Rodrigo, it's your turn. Thank you, Israel. Thank you, Costas and Ricardo and all the people from ITEN. Okay, we continue and my presentation is concentrate on explain how, what has been my experience in the last one month and a half due to the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, okay, that's me. I am not going to talk about me today. This is the situation, this is my subject that I have been teaching this year, this semester for first time. Okay, physics, first year course, six credits, three sessions with a big group, and, and one session per week with a small group. Okay, maybe you can see that, oh, very complicated subject, mathematics, some physics. Okay, no, it's very entertaining uh, subject, and I, 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 I really feel that the students enjoy my teaching. Okay. This is the way I used to teach uh, using PowerPoint presentation that provide lecture notes to the student, mainly to avoid uh, to generate the only taking note students. Um, at the same time, dedicate the time on the blackboard to discuss many examples and exercises. And one of my characteristics by teaching is the use of mobile learning tools. This is an example of the picture. This is exactly one week uh, at the beginning, later, at the beginning of the uh, classroom. In the blackboard, you can see the example on the screen. I have more complicated example, impossible to, to draw on the blackboard. And look at all the students. This is the time when I promote that the student let the pen and start to construct the knowledge using mobile. Okay, this is one of the samples. This is a, a PPT presentation with the lecture notes taken by the, the books that I follow. This is the kind of uh, web tools that I use for graphics, for computation, in order that the people uh, start to manage resources on the web, able work for all the subjects along all the time that they will be studying or working as professionals. Okay, this is one of the main tools that I use. That is a graphic representation on 3D that has been very successful. Okay, I want to, 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 to say that during this time, I have been a very happy math professor. Okay, something that I want to remark is the situation of social and uh, academics of these students. We have a student from the first year, a big variation of background, maturity, high rates of fails and drops, too many silent students. The university rules to keep uh, in, in, the, in the studies or the price of the tuition if they fail are uh, gener generates a lot of anxiety and pressure on families. That is the rates that 50% fails to get, and also the requirements for grants, that also the 50% fails. You can see you have at least to pass 70% of the credit every course. This is the social academic situation that for me is relevant and I always take into account. Okay, when we start with this crisis, I uh, advance on February, a short talk to my student that generated a big surprise talking about the COVID-19 in order to start to prepare ourselves what was going on. Our last session face to face was on March 13. And exactly in that day, I had my first evaluation activity from the continuous evaluation. Okay, on March 15, in the moment that everybody was announced that we don't back home, uh, classroom, I posted the first video where I explained the situation and I also give the outlines how it was going to work along all this time. I based my 
talk about the uh, duality of the crisis war in Chinese that combine two words, danger and opportunity. And I'll try to focus on the opportunity to develop new competence, to work in a different way, to work on self-improvement, words that I will use along my talk. Okay, on April the 1st, after first two weeks, and confirmed that we were going to be in this lockdown situation, I posted a second video explaining all the dimension of the crisis, preparing a SWOT on the uh, all the status for everyone, and organization of the assignment for the rest of the course. I also launched a status fashion survey, and I got 60% a uh, right response that the people feel comfortable and also that was very important 90 percent declared that my subject was the best organized in all the courses okay how did i did all my teaching is asynchronous in order to avoid the conflict with uh, connectivity living conditions that many students has report to me by private communication. I publish three video sessions every week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, less than 30 minutes long, and with the interest to cover all the subjects, all the contain the syllabus of the subject. This is the kind of video that I, I publish using all the resources that we have been training in the previous time, and also provide 15 minute video on problem solving. This is the kind when I solve by hand, I record all the solving, explaining all the details, and I select the problems from the usual list of proposed problems. I open tutorial uh, hours every three times per week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with every day that I publish a session, but I have to recognize that in chat or video calls, the people don't use it too much, and they recognize that in general they are sleeping when I open this. I have to use the class regular class schedule. Like I, I don't, I don't be able to to move to another time. So mainly communication is done by email. This is the kind of response that I have received from uh, my students uh, answering problems, proposing new solutions, on showing that the solution agree with the um, assessment and the record, the figures that I have assigned. Okay. The assessment is one of the critical points that uh, for a student and for uh, staff, faculty are worried about. I have keep it the same organization for a final records, one test per month and final exams. I have tried to reduce the change of the playground and the people feel, some people feel that now everything is going to be probably more difficult because essentially it's different. I have proposed a lot of questionnaire on Moodle platform, multi-choice, short answer, true and false, not too long, uh, no long answer, no scanner, it's only for good training for a student and myself in order to adjust the technology, motivation and try to, to avoid the drops. Uh, but I recognize that at the beginning generate bit stressing to the students. And I identify like decreasing on the number of participants at the same time that the another subject, subject start to propose activities and the people feel it start more engaged and more overwhelmed. After two weeks with five, uh, five small questionnaire, I decide to reduce the number of questionnaire in order to provide to post every each three or five sessions, every week or two weeks. Okay, all focus on self-assessment. I don't want that the people don't get panic and provide several rounds for training. I got the average of participation very interesting, and when I 
did the second test that is a, a computable for the final records the last week i got 71 participants and this is has been the structure of that test okay these are my conclusions closing to to finish I recognize that a synchronous system has been the highly accepted by the student, and I feel that the subject is feasible to pass for the student. The communication is very, very important, and uh, we have to provide new chance because uh, the easy way is dropping for the student. Okay. I have to recognize that the new situation uh, forced me to modify my learning goals. And this is very important. I have discussed this with Israel. Um, here is my resume. Now my learning goals are concentrated on efficiently manage our lecture notes, textbook, online resources, use efficiently the dynamic tool for problem solving, tedious, tedious computations, and increase the global vision of the subject. Try to provide examples and pose problems where all chapters are connected. The focus is to promote the self-improvement of the student. This is one of the uh, topics that I know that is very controversial. What about cheating? Look at this number. The 70% of our economy in Spain, but similar numbers in the European Union, is shadow and is living with us. We have no proven experience without final face-to-face -face exams. And I, I recognize that only personal video interview is 100% is secure. So I am not going to, to, to change what we have at this time and try to solve this like the big problem of online teaching. How can I try to defeat or reduce the impact? Continuous message on ethical behavior between students and the numerous questionnaire that I post, try to detect the black ships in the group and try that by themselves, try to block out. I recognize and I promote that is totally different to give some help to one colleague, one classmate, in order to send a reference on where can you find the solutions, where can you find the base information you need to solve this problem. It's totally different with respect to provide to a person that does not work the final results. I try to promote between them that the cheaters never wins unless we support them in the same way that this the shadow economy is living between us we don't want it but in some sense we our attitude promoted this is a long run impossible to be solved with only one shoot that is at this time the exam this is my deep reflection on this my worries is about another student not the cheaters. My worries is about the low performance, that they are very close and driving to draw out. I'm feeling that the university has not responded to their needs. They feel abandoned by the university. This is my main worry. Okay, we are close to the end. This is some quotes that I used to, 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 to post in my classroom when we have some discussion on some topic about ethic or whatever. I have to say that new times and new ideas are all surrounding. So at the beginning, we may start with the unused one. And there are a lot of theory. This webinar is an example where we can find a lot of possibilities to develop a very, very good work on teaching. The problem, mainly problem, is how is in the, in, the, in the faculty. The first conflict is with ourselves, as professors, as workers, as persons. 
we can go forward if we only drive in the unique direction to repeat the face-to-face -face model and try to, to convert come to convert the, 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 the internet connection on the usual classroom. Okay, thank you for your attention. This is the end. Thank you very much, Israel Garcia and Rodrigo Trujillo from the University of La Laguna, Spain. They are from the Canary Islands. And uh, now we will start a uh, questions and an answer session. There have been some uh, uh, reactions, uh, uh, like most with most of the lecturers, considering your presentations very interesting and uh, very helpful uh, conclusions as well. So uh, now, if you have uh, some questions, we are ready to 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 transfer them to the to the lecturers. The moment is only, you know, congratulations. I don't know. I think that <laughs> Let's I think we, pay. we pay for I think, her. Uh, pay. Yeah, I know, I know. I was ready to pay. <laughs> 20 euros, very, very cheap. <laughs> Thank you. Monse Gallardo Mancebo is uh, saying thanks for 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 your interventions. They, she felt very recognized, and uh, also Na Natalia, I guess, from your experience, please. Are there a lot of students that really cheat at exams? Rodrigo. Well, uh, I I I I, am, I have assumed in order to understand this situation is what I say about shadow economy. You always will be half a part of the um, people that uh, don't care about this. That is something because I talk about the uh, social and economical pressure over the student. That if I don't take into account and I became a policeman, then, then we have a big conflict around that. Okay. Uh, Always have, will appear some people that want to to do good to to get the benefit without work. That is the reason because uh, my strategy is to provide many questionnaires in order that the people feel that here the professor is helping them to improve, and also recognize between them who is the person that they don't want to work at all and only want to get the benefits. Okay. So in that moment, the people can stop and block out in WhatsApp and whatever, no? Okay, but but I explain in my communication with them. It's totally different what you send by WhatsApp. Take a look on the first section of the chapter three. It's totally different to send that kind of message that I provide in my face-to-face -face exam also. The problem is that they don't have the notes in the face-to-face -face exam. So at the end, I, I prefer that they manage all the uh, documentation that is related with the subject, they know where is the the topics, and, and also open the computer, make some comp computations with uh, some web apps and whatever. But I have to recognize that there are. If you have a group of twenty, it's very easy to to, to manage with them. Okay. And for that reason, we think that the the continuous assessment is a is a is the best uh, way okay. to to minimize this uh, kind of uh, students you know uh, as many you know your students the better you will assess them so i think uh, you have to do a lot of uh, ex uh, little tests a lot uh, uh, along the 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 semester to to know the the students okay we have another question we don't know if this is a professor or, or a student but wants to know how do your students cheat on exams? <laughs> Maybe it's a student looking for information. Maybe. <laughs> Israel, too. Uh, you have two kids on, <laughs> on university. <laughs> so how do your students cheat on exams? Well, <laughs> we, we are trying to not to cheat, you know. We, we, we think we have to, to work with them and to make the 
a, a confident environment for them and to make them that they leave the, the door open on proximity to 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 them um and make uh, you, you know the community and communication with uh, our students is important to make that the cheating is not good for them not good for the learning and it's not a problem of the academy or the teacher it's a it's a problem for them at the end so we have to work in that way okay so, uh, yeah there's another question from Ioannis Siripidis uh, saying, as far as I understand, the best approach about online exams is to apply a continuous evaluation, as you have said before. And, and he asks, this can help us also to identify, I guess, the black sheep? Right, yes, right. of course. I think so. Because if you, if you know your, your students, you know, in, in, in several kinds of, of ways, you, the, the, the answer at the, at the in different kinds of uh, exams or tests that you, you make them. So uh, you can identify the black sheep and you can know uh, which, which one is cheating you uh, very soon. Okay. And, okay. and also between them, between the student, the same student yeah. identify what is the person that it's always asking in order to get the records and don't work. So the people mm -hmm. start to, to uh, isolate that people. Okay. Yeah. So in, in some sense, you are introducing some ethical behavior because the people can identify, not for one shoot in order to identify that the person that is nervous, that is anxious because he's going to lose the, the grant, he, he, he's worried about if they cannot continue at the university, whatever. In that moment, I feel that between the student can generate some kind of pressure in order to, why don't you help me, no? But if everybody recognizes that this is the way how you can get your records and pass the, the, the subject, uh, it's yeah. not necessary to be asking me all the time, only when there is an exam. Okay. Okay. Uh, so there's some, a collective, there's a collective response to that. Yes. Yeah, the same it. attitude with the shadow economy. That has been a very good parallelist uh, thinking in this web webinar and so, okay? But uh, this is part of our uh, skills, the, the soft skills that we have to develop in, in this environment, okay? Good. That is Natalia, Natalia Binder asks, uh, have you got normative and legislative base on digital learning in your university? Are there any fixed quality standards to online courses? Well, I think we are developing all all this, you know, because we have to move, but uh, we don't have uh, already. Our, our university is, is a traditional face-to-face -face university. Yeah. Okay, and it has been a, a, a really, really big experience and first experience for all of us. Okay, too mm -hmm. fast. Yes, all, all, all the, the, regulate, the, the rules about the uh, capability to take pictures, to record session, and so has been established two weeks ago. So uh, we are the university is trying to to rule. Okay, there has been recommendations. There have been list of resources. Mm -hmm. Israel and me, we have been selected um, to be dynamizers to help to people from another uh, departments areas. Uh, Israel is helping people from economy. Uh, and business in order to prepare teaching, to prepare exams. I am helping people from science. So the university is moving forward. Mm -hmm. as, as far as I know, also many, many universities have made the effort on a technical way previously, I, I, I think, but not in a normative or regulative way, no? Yeah. Because norm normally universities have like this kind of unit of virtual education unit, but mostly focus on, on, on only technology or tools, but not as a procedure or not as process inside. That's it, because we have to move very, very, you know, very soon to, to this way of, of teaching, okay. Okay, another question is, apart from model that my university doesn't use, do you suggest any example, like Spring Quiz Maker for testing in the form of, of questionnaires or quizzes or multiple choices, it is being discussed a lot at my university. I don't know, mm. but 
quiz maker. Uh, but I, I would say Google Docs and Google uh, uh, forms. forms, they can create yeah. you know, this kind of uh, forms, yeah, mm -hmm. Okay, I, 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 I was at the beginning of decision of my university, taking decision on my university about the platform. And I visit many universities and I have to say that the common idea is don't care the platform. It's in, the, the, the main point is the content. Okay, yeah. choose one. If you have to change in one year or two years or in two months, if you start to work with one, you, your mind is totally prepared to change. Maybe this is the point in order that you, your university to the person is asking the question to, to fix the solution. Mm -hmm. Because this is going to be for many, many, many times in the next future. So yeah. this is... Is what I say about the crisis war in Chinese. This is an opportunity for all of us. Opportunity because I have put attention on recording videos, on prepare my microphone, my phone, whatever. Okay, I start to use the, the tablet of my daughter in order to, to record the solving problems. And so, because this has been the first time that I need it. Okay, choose one platform, choose one tool, try to learn discuss, open, comment with another colleague in order to share the experience, in order to increase your, your knowledge as fast as possible and start, don't worry about the platform. Okay, I think that it's time to complete, you know, the session because we would like to give the time to our attendees to get rest and be with us on Thursday. Because on Thursday, <laughs> uh, it's the last part of our webinar. We are very glad that uh, the majority of you from the first session, you were with us also on this uh, second session. Uh, on, on, on Thursday, uh, we will send the reminders. We will have the session again at uh, 5 o'clock Central European time. We are going to have six, as the last round, excellent speakers. Uh, we, the main focus of the final a webinar will be the next day. A lot of things, you know, they have discussed by our two colleagues here from Spain, from the uh, Canary Islands. We are going to discuss a lot about the blended teaching, uh, how to use uh, learning analytics in order to somehow quantify uh, the frequent testings that to Rodrigo and uh, Israel has uh, proposed as a main tool of assessment in order somehow statistically to isolate also these black ships. But I will say, I totally agree with Rodrigo, I just said it before, that our society and our ecosystem should isolate them. He said, what is happening with the frauding? We are telling about the students, but we should ask us as academics how much frauding along the publication exists. I, so, I only ask one question. Every no time, course, no time. Sorry. <laughs> next time. Uh, next so, Thursday. <laughs> next Thursday. Next Thursday, Rodrigo. Thursday. Uh, so, a lot of people asking about a leaf. A leaf will be with us uh, next Thursday. So, we're going to have uh, six speakers next uh, Thursday. Uh, I think that me and Ricardo would like to thank you a lot for your participation. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Israel. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you. Uh, thank uh, Daniel, uh, Alessandro. Uh, did I forget someone? I'm old. That's why. Uh, <laughs> thanks, you know, all the speakers. Thanks. And Lauren. Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Oh, Lauren, of course. Lauren, I mean. <laughs> and uh, also all the attendees. And as we wrote you on the on the chatting, uh, please do not forget to evaluate. And we hope to see you uh, on Thursday to be with us for the next day. So thank we you very much. Uh, the link of the evaluation form in the mm -hmm. in the both in the YouTube and in the Facebook channel. So please remember to evaluate us. It would be great to improve our next webinars. So thank you, everyone. Uh, for being here today and uh, see you Buenas very noches. soon next Buenas Thursday. Buenas noches. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you.